Welcome everyone to the Hexa Media Group podcast. My name is David Cly. And if you've been watching us recently, we have a podcast to where we interview business owners. And today we have the special occasion of having Gary Berger of Berger Law Firm with us today to answer some really cool questions regarding him versus AI versus general personal injury and car accident uh, questions. It's going to be a really fun interview. Gary, would you like to introduce yourself, please? That camera over there. Hey, David, how are you? I'm doing great. Great. I'm Gary Berger. I'm, an o- I'm the owner of Berger Law. I'm a trial lawyer here in St. Louis. I've been representing injury victims for 30 or so years. Dave and I have been, Dave's been my uh, marketing partner for seven or eight years. Or Long so. time. And, uh, and yeah, and we've done a lot together, done a lot of work together. And so. many hundreds of positive Google reviews later. Uh, many so hundreds, all kinds of stuff. If you're not convinced by that dramatic, wonderful uh, introduction there, you will be after powerful. this. <laughs> all right. So I've got a couple of softballs here we're going to start with. Shoot. Uh, these are just general informational questions. We're going to get to the tough stuff, so no worries on that. Right. Uh, you're not getting out of this easy. We got we got some good ones. All right. Wonderful. So the first one I'd like to start with, why don't you start by telling me about your most difficult case? So I, I tried a case in St. Charles County. It was a medical malpractice case that I tried for two weeks. Well, I've had other difficult cases, too. I mean, I haven't won every case, but mm-hmm. but in this one, I lost. And um, it's the same year I won the, like the second highest verdict in the state of 100, over $100 million. And I also got the third best defense verdict for the defense lawyer uh, who thanked me. He said, you're the reason why I'm here. But we, we, the jury defense verdict was after a week and a half that it was a sad medical malpractice case where a 72-year-old man went in to see a psychiatrist on a Friday afternoon with his wife two of his children because he was having a lot of problems. Mm-hmm. And now, was I, this after an accident or you medical nope, malpractice, nope, you said? Oh, nope. this is a malpractice. And he and the, the family wrote a letter, letter were begging for this for this exam. And the and the and the psychiatrist blew him off. Ten minutes med check, didn't do anything, put him on one med that he never filled. And and sadly that night he killed the three people in his in that office with him and himself. And so it was a murder-suicide case Wow! where uh, we sued the psychiatrist because he, he breached the standard of care. He was negligent, and, and the family was reaching out for his help, and he just wasn't there. And, and th- th- that case was hard because, for a lot of reasons, it's, it's the, the family. I'm still friends with them. Mm-hmm. They're, they're the most salt-of-the-earth, hard-working, nice, kind the guy who, who who killed himself, nice, kind, center of the family, breakfast the next morning with the family, mm-hmm. the guy, church, front row of church every Sunday, um, you, you you know you know the mental health um, uh, 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 care in, in our country is hard on everybody, and and we're thank God we're talking about that more these days than we used yeah, to, yeah. Um, but, you know, and dealing with death and trying a death case and trying to bring his life and the lives of those four people into the courtroom, talking about death. You know, we walk with death. As I get older, I more of my friends are dying and more things. And in America, we don't really talk about that. I hate to you mm-hmm. say, I'm going to start off with an easy softball question. <laughs> no, that's We're okay. Into death and losing cases. So one of my most... First question, just remember that, everybody. So, so, so <laughs> sorry to bore you guys. But, I mean... You know, so you're dealing with death and trying to talk about someone's life and the standard of care of a psychiatrist. My dad was a psychologist. They mm. have hard jobs. I get it. Doctors have very hard jobs. This one, he missed it, and he should have gotten it, and he should have done basic things mm-hmm. to try to help give a cocoon, a level of protection. Never asked if there was a gun. Never mm-hmm. asked these questions. And and uh, we lost that case. I, I was crying when I'm... It's very unusual for me to be, I mean, I'm direct examining my client and yeah. I'm crying while I'm asking them questions in my case, you know, and, and very emotional case we lost. It was very mm. sad. Um, well, I imagine that that takes a, a big toll on you. And I think that, you know, when I was putting together these questions, you know, one of the things that I was trying to think of is like, what questions would I want to ask an injury lawyer? Because everybody has their own profession, uh, profession. Everybody, as you just said, they have their own lives. They lead their own has, uh, we never think about death. We never think about others, which hopefully, you know, uh, we, we do more of that, uh, as people become more well aware of how important mental health is. So the next question I wanted to get to, because there's 
and you're probably more familiar than I am with all the lawyer jokes, the, um, what would you call it? I Skid get, marks. Yeah, yeah. All the, all the different things that float around. Oh, you know, they just do this and they take people's money and blah, blah, blah. So I really wanted to talk a bit of more of a personal angle. And one of the questions that I came up with is, what is it like to be a personal injury lawyer? Because I would imagine it's hard to deal with other people's difficulties. Like you talked about a psychiatrist, right? Where you're having to, da- people are basically downloading all their issues onto like your mind and you as a professional have to help them. So I would imagine it's hard to see the difficulties faced by people when they come to you. I'd imagine a lot of them are hurt, upset, probably in debt because of medical bills. They're scared. They don't really know what to do. Um, Can you tell me a little bit more about like, what's that experience? Great question. And you know, you, you know, your knowledge of this shows me your knowledge of my business because you've heard these things before. Mm -hmm. So you're tapping right into it. So and I, and I work with this with my staff and my people. you got to remember that those people are in crisis because they can't work, they're hurt, they're worried, they're scared, they're mm-hmm. afraid because it's life interrupted. Whether it's a car wreck or a slip and fall or a med mal or whatever, it's a big injury. And, and, and they have a financial hit and, and they're coming to me. So I, so I have to sit next to them. I, I have to be with them in mm-hmm. that and I have to listen to them. I can't let myself get too emotionally involved right away. Otherwise, it'd be a long day. It already is a long day. <laughs> right, right, I'm sure. And, and, and uh, so you have to listen to them, be with them. Um, and then you have to zone in and in, and because they're not calling you, they're not calling me to say, woe is me and me to commiserate. They want legal advice. So, right. And people are surprised when they hear me talking to clients how I, I say, okay, hold on, I'm going to pause you. And I jump into the legal advice and I say, here's the deal. Here's what you have to do. You may not want to hear it, but here's the deal. You have a tough case. You have a good case. You have a, you have a tough case on liability, meaning it may be hard to prove damages. Or you have a good case on liability, but there's no insurance. Mm. Or you have a good case on liability, but did that cause the problem you were there for? Because it's a med mal case and you were already there because you were having a medical issue. So, so, so. It's hard in that I have to listen to them and I have to give them. I tell people, I say, listen, you're going to take a financial hit and you're not going to get the money back for six months or a year. Right. There's a tension between good money and easy money. You want the good money, you got to wait because you got to fight these people because they don't open the pocketbooks. And we'll get to the insurance and, questions no, no, here in a bit. No, we will. We will. But, <laughs> but the, the point is, I tell them, like, you know what? You got to give up that truck you just bought. Let that go back to the bank, or you may need to move to a cheaper apartment, or you may need to do this. You need to take care of your financial stuff, and they don't, and 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 they think they should call a lawyer and get a bunch of money right away. That's not how it works, right? So you're dealing, and you're dealing, and then they are they're afraid about their physical condition, and I have to help. You should go to this. I know a lot about the medicine. I do doctors' depots all the time, so I'm telling mm-hmm. them. Go to this doctor, not that doctor. Can I suggest this? You might want to do this, blah, 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 blah. And you're navigating insurance and their insurance. And then you have also, you have this all the time. Is like, well, I was with my friend. I don't want to sue my friend. And well, be, well, we, when, we, when we ride in cars or when we go visit people at their houses, it's not that we know those people. So, of course, mm-hmm. you were with your friend. Of course, right. you were at your friend's house when the debt collapsed or blah, 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 whatever the circumstances. So you got to walk with them. You got to you got to cut to the chase and give them the legal advice that they need, and they'll value it later on. How do you generally see people react when you explain the timelines? So, for example, you just said like, "Hey, you, get, you might have to move. You might because that, that's some of that stuff sounds kind of scary because, like you said, it's a life interrupter. So, how do most people react to that when you say, "Hey, look, it might be three to six months if you really want the true, I guess, what you're entitled to from a hard fought settlement." 99% of they love it. They, they love it when I, when I interrupt them because I do. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and then I give them the legal advice and they're like, Oh wow, that's great. That's great. And I always say, listen, is there any question in the forefront of your mind you need answered right now mm-hmm. before you can listen to me? Cause the question is, are they going to, the answer to your question is, are they going to be able to listen to you? And that was your question to me just was, do they listen to you? And right. they do. They love it. First I clear their brain about whatever is in the front of their frontal lobe and then they can't listen. And then I answer that. And then we move on to the next thing. And I explain to them, listen, if you want to, it's like the joke, you know how to settle a case for 20 grand, mm-hmm. start with a million dollar case and mess it up. Right. <laughs> so, so yeah. you, so I tell him, I said, listen, I can get you 10, 20 grand right away, but th- this is your only time to recover. This is the only thing you'll ever have. 
Are they going to offer you a little money? Yes, because they know there's unequal bargaining power. That claims adjuster has a thousand cases and you got one. Mm -hmm. This is your only time to recover. You need to make sure this, this, and this. There's other ways. It's worth the financial. And then if they push back at me, I say, let, I say, I do things like that. What's the most money you've ever had in your bank account? And they'll tell me. I say, <laughs> well, here's what I'm going to put. If you wait a yeah. little bit longer, isn't that worth it? So you could put things in perspective. And it's hard to think about money that way. But when you put it in a perspective in terms of their life, it, I, I never have a problem. Well, generally speaking, it, when they come to you, what's, because you'd mentioned what's at the forefront of their mind. Is it first money or is it recovery? Like how, you've, you've dealt with hundreds, if not thousands of clients by now. Is it, how do they come to you or is it, does it vary? It varies. It's never about money in the beginning. Usually it's always about, I got it. it most of the times it's, I get, this happened to me. What do I do? I have no idea. It's starting at, 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 at 101. It started the basic questions. Well, mm -hmm. did they have insurance? Who's your insurance? Have you gotten the property damage? Have you gotten your medical? Should you put it on your health insurance or should you go what you should do? Uh, um, uh, how does this work? Do I put a claim in? Do I even need a lawyer? I get that. Do I? Yeah, I can add value to your case. Sometimes I tell them I can't. You're lightly injured. Go settle it yourself and turn around quick. Is that the, the soft tissue damage? Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> I if, think. You know, if, if you, yeah, because if they just go to one ER visit and then there's no more medical, I can't really add value to that case. And they're better off giving the claims adjuster the e, their ER records, adding a couple grand to it and settling themselves. I have parts in my book about the books on my website about this that you published and, and we, and we talk about that, <clears throat> but if it's, uh, and, and anyway, yeah, but there's a lot of curveballs those claim adjusters can send at them. So, so in the fourth, there's no really one question. They're, they're, they're confused. They're shocked. It's life interrupted. And then you're, then um, a lot of times I'm answering the questions they don't know to ask. Mm -hmm. So I guess that leads me into my next one. I told you there's a couple softballs. So the next one is, you don't have to answer this. If you, you know, know some people in this industry, but. I answer all questions. Okay, very good. What is the thing you hate most about insurance companies, specifically about how their offers or how they conduct themselves during one of these proceedings? Well, uh, I don't have enough time. No. So, so, so my joke is that, that, that insurance companies, their job is to collect premiums and deny claims. And they have specific ways that they make the, make the payout on a claim as low as they can. They have a series of things. They, they tell you that they, they have all these lies they tell people. And they mm -hmm. are lies. And now there are good insurance companies. There's good adjusters out there. There are good companies that take care of their people. But they also know that if they settle the case direct, if you don't go to a lawyer, it's going to go cheaper. They also know if they tell you, well, we only pay for six weeks of medical after that, you don't get recovery. Then they don't have to pay for that. They also say chiropractic doesn't count. They also say, oh, you're off work. Your work pays for you because you have that benefit of the work. We don't have to pay you for that. So you have to go Not through your true. work. Yeah. You still get that. It's called a collateral source. They don't get the benefits. You also paid a premium. You also worked there for five years and you're so your employer is taking care of you and you paid the premium on that policy for them to pay you for short-term disability, long-term mm -hmm. disability. Um, they'll say things like, Hey, you had a pre, you had a, you had a pre-existing, Oh, you had back problems 10 years ago. You can't recover in this case or you can only recover a grant. And you're like, it's totally different. I was sim I was asymptomatic. I had no symptoms for seven years. What are you talking mm -hmm. about? Nope. They're going to lay it on that. So, and, and they will call you, they'll send you a check at this case. They'll send you a check. You cash it. You didn't know you just settled your case and they, Oh, here's a partial payment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look at the memo mm -hmm. line uh, to see if they really did that. You know, um, they'll say, Oh, you know, your mind, your kid didn't get treatment. They can't recover. There's, there's a host of things they tell you. Um, and it, they're predatory They're the, 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 uh, and, and they're feeling you out to see if you're going to bite and, and, and settle that case on the cheap. Cause you need the money. Cause you're hurt. Right. You don't understand it. And I'll tell you, it happens where people get in a wreck, blah, blah, blah. They, they go to the ER a couple of times, their neck still hurts, and then they settle it. And then three months later, they're getting neck surgery, and they cannot recover for that. Well, so that's, you make, go ahead. Finish no, your statement. that's it. Well, I just wanted to say, because a lot of people, I don't feel like they know this. Like, once you accept that check, you're done, and you can't come back and sue them again for the same thing. Whatever you come to in terms of agreement, there's no wait a minute, we forgot about this. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, and, and this all ties, I, I get this question from new clients all the time. It's, it's, it ties into your insurance company. Yeah, yeah, if, if, you, if they pay to settle your case and you settle your case, you're done. It doesn't matter if that 
if that leg that's broken, if the fracture doesn't heal and the rod doesn't happen, if you need an amputation later, doesn't matter if that neck ache that you think is gone gets worse and then you have radiating pain and muscle weakness in an arm. It's called a herniated disc and you have atrophy or you have shaking or you can't hold a, I have all these clients that can't hold a coffee cup. They mm. can't work. They can't do that. And then they need neck surgery and then they get better. <clears throat> so are the wage loss in the future, anything from that much, as soon as you sign that release, there's a number, we're going to pay you 10 grand, five grand, two grand for this. Boom. You sign it. You're done. You can never sue them again. Mm. There's it, you're done. You're done. I, I think when, you know, a lot of people make the attorney or lawyer jokes, they don't understand that it goes back to like the George Carlin joke. It's like, have you ever heard the one about car accidents where he says, if you got hit by a car, he says, are you okay? It's like, no, you just hit this person with 4,000 pounds of steel. <laughs> They're not okay. <laughs> I, took, I, took, I deposed a truck driver on Friday, and I got a, I do this in every truck case. I got out his bill of lading, and everyone's like, what are you doing? And I said, How much? his truck was 75,000 pounds when he rear-ended my client's camper and their truck. Forced him off the road, blah, blah, blah. I don't oh, I'm know, sure. But I mean... Yeah, for, force equals mass times acceleration, right? So if you have a lot of mass, George Carlin, and I, I'm a huge George Carlin fan, yeah. huge, I get it. Um, if force equals mass, and I will not do his seven words in your <laughs> podcast that I cannot say. We can bleep them. But, but um, uh, he said them really fast. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, for, so, so if you have a lot of force, you can go 10 miles an hour if you're 75,000 pounds. That is a lot of force, right? So there you Stop. go. Stop, yeah. Yeah, and, and this deceleration... The, the injuries people get with sudden deceleration, you know, your, 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 your spine works on a pivot. So you get, you hit you your shoulder, you have rotator cuff tears, you have this whiplash. Oh, whiplash. It's a bunch of bullshit. There you go. Hey, there you go, George Carlin. <laughs> a, a, a nod out. And, and um, a nod. Um, whiplash is very serious. People, it's been, people have known about it forever. Look what the NFL's doing and protecting people more. Look what people are catching. And people are like, can't tell you how many people well, like that, drivers race cars nascar remember when dale earnhardt broke his neck and now they have to wear the thing yeah you'll get these all the time and and and, and relatively medium or light impacts can it throws all that force up to there and then your head your your body's pushed forwards your head goes back and forward and you're pivoting your entire spinal column goes through this one little area in your cervical neck in in your vertebrae right there and if it gets pinch or hurt it's it's bad it really is. So we've talked a little bit about insurance companies yep. and the like. Uh, hopefully I don't make any enemies with this question. What is the biggest pet peeve you have with other lawyers when you're on the other opposing side in the courtroom? When I'm fighting them? Mm -hmm. um, so so my, when they're jerks, when they're mean, when they don't have to be. So mm -hmm. law, we're, we, we're fighters. Lawyers and litigators are fighters. But... I have great relationships with the defense bar. These other lawyers all the time. We do our work. We 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 do our depots. We do it. But but when we but we know we got to get along together and and we got to settle cases. And I always tell people, you can't be too mean to the defense lawyer. They're the one that's going to pay you. So <laughs> that they know there's lines that you that you draw uh, that you don't go over. And when the other lawyer goes of it intentionally just to be a jerk. Um, that really aggravates me because it's very inefficient because a defense lawyer could, if he wants, drag out a lawsuit for six more months or a year by objecting to this, not letting this, delaying this, playing this. And he gets to bill the insurance company more because he bills by the hour. So he does that and he knows he's going to make an extra 10, 20 grand in billables. And you're sitting there going, knowing that you represent a family and they're right. not going to have any money for another six months to a year. And they're living paycheck to paycheck and they're hurt and they can't get the surgery or they know, or, and, and you know, the insurance company figured this out a long time ago. If they kept that extra 500 grand in their bank account for an extra six months at, at you know, 5% interest, they're going to mm -hmm. make another, you know, uh, I don't know, five grand, you know, whatever it is, you know, they're doing their math. And, and that's what the point of that is. And I, and, and judicial inefficiency uh, 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 pisses me off because mm -hmm. I'm like, listen, here's the deal. You know you're going to settle it. You know right. you're going to settle it for this much, and you know that you're going to delay it until after I take all the depots and I'm about to go and pick a jury, and now you're going to pay me. Can we just get this done? But you know what? You can't. I can have this over and over where clients come in and say, 
I don't even know if I need you because this is an open but shut, open and shut case and we ought to get paid a lot of money. And then mm -hmm. two years later, they go, wow, they really fought it hard. Thank God I came to you because I didn't know they were going to be such jerks and fight me on everything and try to make everything an issue. And what defense lawyers do too, they'll throw things up on the wall and see what sticks. So they'll say, mm -hmm. oh, he got in this injury before. And, you're, and you point out, well, he was asymptomatic. It was really fine. He was a he was a Olympic. He was running marathons. What do you mean it was from this? <laughs> or, or they say, <clears throat> you know, there's only so much in insurance. And then right before you said, oh, there's more. There's another policy we got, or this, or that, or this. You know, they're just throwing up roadblocks. And it's my job as a lawyer to get around every roadblock for my clients and equal that playing field. Sorry for the long answer. No, that's all right. That's that was a a good answer. Well, that that again, these kind of lead Am I into one another. The Chat GPT yet? We'll get there. All right, we're almost there. No Don't pressure. worry. No pressure. So what is it like to settle a million dollar plus accident case and what generally makes those different? Because you've got quite a few of them on the site. You know, and, and I know that we do tout them, but we also try to stay humble too because, again, it's more about the client. It's not always about the number. Um, what, what makes that different? Because we talked about how the insurance company and the other lawyers like to play games and drag things out or, you know, in some cases, like you said, outright lie. What makes it different when you know you, you somebody comes to you and, and you're like, oh god, this is like a big deal. You know, you're you're you need to be compensated for a lot. So the differences are the injuries are more profound. There's surgeries. There's broken things. There's permanent injuries that are lifelong injuries to someone that takes it from the the twenty, fifty, hundred thousand dollar case to the million, two million dollar case. Or there's a death, a sad death involved, a loss of life. And I've said a lot of those. I settled a case for 1.25 about a month and a half ago. Settled some death, a lot of death cases recently that are sad. So there's a lot more money involved. So it, there's a bigger injury. So you have that more satisfaction. Like, wow, we were able to do it. Because, you know, people get injured. People get million-dollar injuries when there's 50 grand in insurance coverage, all right? So you're, you're having the perfect storm of good liability, big injuries, and a lot of insurance coverage to cover it. Because I've had to talk to a lot of people. I've settled a lot of cases for a million dollars. But I've also looked at people in the eye and said, there's only this much in insurance. I'm sorry. This is what we get you. We're going to do other things. We're going to get your bills taken care of. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to structure so this money debt. for the child. We're going to do this and that. We're going to do the best we can. But having that, having that big insurance, that, that good insurance coverage to cover them is great. And then, But the other thing is there's a lot of hard things with a big settlement because there's more liens. The insurance company wants their money back. The bill collectors want their money back. Mm -hmm. Because Medicare, Medicaid want may want money back, and so sometimes you also take that money and you put it, and you have to handle the liens and reside. You know, we set uh, we we reduced six hundred grand in liens to about two hundred and eighty grand for this lady that we settled this case for. Now we got her one point two five, but but on the back end we got a lot of money in the front end. But on that example, we also saved her like you know two hundred and. 50 grand on the liens paying out money that would and have is, had to come from the settlement. Otherwise, is it a good lien? Are they entitled to that money? Will they negotiate? So we negotiate against the insurance company for that, but we also negotiate on the back end so that the money they get in their pocket is as much as we can. And then also sometimes you struck. So what if, 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 if someone, if the money's for a child, you have to put it in an annuity or a structured settlement. And I have got the financial people so that that money sits there until the child is 18 and you worry about that. Or if it's an adult, what if they want to be getting, what if it's a, what if it's your mom in a nursing home that slips and, and, and has a broken hip or is a decubitus ulcer or mm -hmm. has that she, you don't want to give her so much money that she loses her entitlement to government benefits. And then she lost that Medicaid bed and she doesn't have that. So, so you have to structure that too. So there's other, with the big money, you know, more money, more problems. No, but with, <laughs> with, with more money, you have to just be careful and vigilant because you want it to go to the right place. It's their only recovery. We talked about that a little early. It's the only money they're ever going to get. It's a one right. and done. It's the only thing. And it's a good recovery. Yeah, but but you also want to safeguard that for their whole life. And I have this talk with my clients. I, this is a lot of money. But remember, this is for your whole life. You've got 40 more years. You Don't go buy that last. Ferrari exactly. just yet. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So obviously we know you're not a fan of the insurance companies based upon some yes, of your answers. That is true. Are there any ones, and again, there this is in no way any promotion for any, are there any that you think people should buy their insurance through because it's better utilized if something ever happens, or there's just not as much pushback when they need to use that insurance? Because it's their money, right? They're paying these premiums, like you had said. 
Are there any that when you go into, uh, I guess, litigation with that they're easier to deal with? There are. Are you asking name names? Is that this? If you question? want to, yeah. You know, you know. Uh, can I can I tell you who not to buy? Sure. Don't buy Allstate. No Allstate. Don't buy. It's not the good hands people. Don't buy Unique Insurance. Don't buy a small little company because they're not going to protect you. And Allstate's notoriously cheap and notoriously jerks. The other companies, and I and I could name others, but I'm pretty sure. comfortable in. <laughs> and, and, and dumping on Allstate and Unique, and so I had an article Those are just once time speci- unique, specifically it's a bad, uniquely bad insurance company because I tried a couple of cases against them, and we won repeatedly. And they're mm-hmm. out of Chicago; they're terrible. I mean, I mean, I mean, I hope they don't sue me, but I mean, you know, but I have, I have the truth as a defense. Don't. I mean, I have a number of cases where they don't treat their insurance correctly. So, um, so now other other companies ebb and flow. They'll go. So you know. This company will be good for a couple of years, seem like they're adjusting, and then they decide some policy, they want to save money, and so they they go down and they don't settle cases fairly and stuff. But um, so it, it can it can ebb and flow, I guess, over time. You know, I've been doing this for 30 years longitudinally. You know, you'll have some, oh, they're being tough now, but, you know, we'll, mm-hmm. we'll fight them and stuff. But um, so it depends. A bit of consumer advice there. I've tried a <laughs> lot of cases against Allstate. I, I'm like, what are you, why are we trying this case? All right. So the next one, I'm sure you've answered this a million times. So how do you settle a car accident case for the maximum amount? So um, uh, one is you got to get a good lawyer to do it. Okay. And then you have to have the, the injuries to, to, to warrant that settlement. And, and I guess first, though, it can't be your fault, all right? So you go through the <laughs> steps. One is you get in a car wreck. Two, it's not your fault. It's the other side fault. Three is that you have enough force, enough enough injury. It's not just a little fender bender in a parking lot. That's not going to herniate a disc. Mm-hmm. So, so you have to have enough force involved in the accident. And then, and then you make a claim for the policy limits. Now, for the maximum amount you can, sometimes that's good and bad. What if you got a million? I said, what if you got a million dollars in in damages, but there's twenty five thousand dollar policy? That's not good. Okay, so so then what you do is then you go get your medical care and you cooperate with your medical care. So you go to the doctors, you do the follow up, you do the necessary thing, you create that record because people think juries and insurance adjusters think if you got injuries, you go to the doctor. So you go do that and you and you go through that. And then what we do is is we use we we were we make policy limits demands and and we use some special law in Missouri and Illinois and the other states in which we practice where if if you give them a chance to settle for the policy limits and if they don't you yank it and you don't give them that chance again and you set that you set them up for what's called a bad faith uh, a bad faith claim meaning that they acted in bad faith in adjusting the claim. If you got a million dollar case and they won't settle for 50 grand, the insurance company can't gamble their insured's money in a trial. They got to mm. pay the 50 grand and so that's called bad faith. So insurance companies every contract has an implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing. And what that means is that if the, and if an insurance company is acting in bad faith or acting wrongly and because they can say I'll never pay you and you're like what? We, we got a million dollars in medical bills and there's a 25,000. They, they can make you go to trial. Hmm. Now, the problem is, though, is when you go to trial, let's say I get a million dollar verdict. Let's say you hit me and, and you, into your car. Then I would have a million dollar claim against you, a million dollar judgment against you. But the insurance company is only going to be 25 grand. You're, you're on the hook for 975 in that example. And it would be unfair for your insurance or it would be in bad faith for your insurance company to treat you like that, to do that to you, to leave you as an insured who paid premiums for 20 years and only had one case. And you're like, you're not settling this case. You've got to adjust this claim. Various states have various regulations on guarding and protecting insureds, protecting people who pay, pay the premiums on the policy, protecting you. And I have insurance. Everybody has insurance. You have and, to and <laughs> for this reason. Yeah, I would imagine. And, so, and there's some there's some insurance companies that treat their insurance fairly. I mean, we've all heard the stories about someone with, with a flood at their house or some, pro- and then the insurance company won't pay them. And Roof, the money. flood, Roof, electrical, flood, whatever. Water yeah. in the basement, whatever it is. It happens all the time. And, and sometimes insurance companies don't treat people fairly. 
hello, there's a hmm. there's a department insurance in every state. There's code of state regulations in every state. There's the director of insurance. Whenever I sue an insurance company, there's a Missouri official in Jefferson City who's responsible for accepting process. So <clears throat> there's all, but that's a, that's not a federal state. It's not a federal uniform system. It's state to state. Hmm. Some states regulate it more than others. Illinois has more robust. So did you know if if you get hit in a car in Missouri, they don't have to tell you how much insurance the defendant has. In Illinois, they do. Mm. So the the law varies state to state, and with regulation or regulation about uh, what is the boundaries or how we cabin how a an insurance company acts. Some are good, some are bad. Um, you know, some are going to obey that. So so what we do, and I know it's a long answer, David. Sorry again. Um, is that we make a we make a claim, we make a demand on them, settle within the policy limits. We're going to leave it open for 90 days. If you don't, we're going to withdraw that. It'll never be offered again. And so then that way, the so we give them a chance to protect the insured. But if they don't do that, that's their problem. Now, if they offer it to me on the 91st day, I'm going to take it. If, and the 100th day, I'm going to take it. But you, you, you let the insurance company know that we know our stuff. We know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. You got to protect. You got to pay us as the claimant, but you also got to protect your insured because they have rights too. And you can't throw your insured out to the wolves because I don't want to go after personal people's money. I want to go after the insurance money. Now we do do that sometimes uh, when well, we're forced to. And that's another question I had because you had mentioned like the at fault. Is there any scenario where a person that's at fault can collect or not? Yes, because what if they're only partially at fault? Mm, good what, point. What if, what if, the, what if, what if, what if, what if you, what if I'm driving down the road and you rear end me? Well, it's your fault because you're rear me. And you're like, well, wait a minute, you're driving at 65 miles an hour. There's not a car within 10 miles in front of you. And you slam on the brakes for no reason. Mm -hmm. You suddenly stopped on the highway. And that's against the law, too. That's against the rules of the road, too. So, so was I negligent and rear-ended you? Yes. Or, 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 I'm sorry, I forgot the hypothetical. <laughs> it's okay. Were you negligent and rear-ended me? Yes. Was I negligent in stopping suddenly? Yes. So it's really going to depend upon the circumstance. Do you feel like it's, if someone is at fault, do you feel like it's still worth reaching out to you know, contact an attorney and talk about that? Absolutely. And that you remember when I said what the insurance adjusters tell you to get to settle your case, one of the things they say is that you're at, you're at fault. Well, wait a minute. I wasn't at fault. That person stopped suddenly. I wasn't at fault. You know, whatever. But they're going to tell you that. And but you don't need to believe them. They'll mm. say, "Well, the police report says that." Yeah, you know, about half the time the police reports are wrong. It's okay. Police officers do an amazing Human beings. job. Yeah. It's a hard job. But police officers at a scene of an accident may be thinking about that murder they got to go solve, rather than they get the which witness <laughs> name and who was in what car. Because and they make it if they're on the side of the highway in the rain, and then they type it up later. So let's get, we're we're going to give them a, every break because they deserve it. But sometimes stuff in police reports are wrong, mm -hmm. and then um, and then and then you got to deal with it later. I ha I do it all the time. I did it on Friday in this deposition. This truck driver, he's like. Well, you told the, the, the them that you were uh, that you were uh, two car lengths away. Well, I meant to say I was a whole semi truck length behind him. Ah, whatever. <laughs> so, um, so if you're partially at fault, still make a claim. Every state has this percentage thing. It's called comparative fault. So when we go to the jury, the jury gets to decide. Dave was 25 percent at fault, and Gary was 75. Then you get the total damages. You do the math, and you figure out what the person gets. Got it. So our our law is our, our jurisprudence, our law, and our trial system is very able to handle that. And jurors are smart. They'll figure it out. They'll hear the facts. They're like, all right, 50-50, 25 75. They'll figure it out. So I'd imagine when a lot of people come to you, they have some preconceived notions about what their case is worth. So from hundreds of different settlements and verdicts, et cetera, what do you feel like or what is your experience on the average car accident settlement? You know, uh, what a great question. So from what I've read and what I've said, I'd say around $25,000. Mm -hmm. and, and that's taking into account um, the low cases, the ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 cases, as, 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 as well as the, as the million-dollar cases. And, and now I think that's across the board. I frankly think that when the case is in our office, the average is higher than that mm -hmm. because we're good lawyers. We're trial lawyers. People know we demand the highest price. And also, about my office, if someone's got a lower car accident case, I tell them, I tell them to go handle it on your own because it's harder for me and my law firm to 
add value to a $15,000 car crash case versus a half a million dollar car crash case. So Mm -hmm. I try to, and I give people free tips and it's in books that we have on our website about, I say, Hey, listen, take, give them your medical bills, ask for three grand and so you can settle on your own. I don't need to take a third of that. I don't need Mm -hmm. to take a percentage of that. Um, so, but I think if, if you look at everything holistically, including people settle on their own and little stuff and that kind of stuff, I think right around 25 grand, maybe 30 grand. And, you know, sometimes too, the, the minimum requirement in insurance is 25 grand in every mm-hmm. state. So that kind of drives it low too. I was going to say, there's probably influencers on why that's the average. Right, right. right. But most people, so that's the average nation. Now, most people coming in my door, I mean, we're going to shoot, we're going to try to get you 50 grand on an, on an average case if we can now. Sometimes those are harder. It depends on the medical, depends on the severity of your Depends injuries. on the insurance company. <laughs> on the insur- well, you know, yeah. Well, you know, it, it, that takes longer. You know, if an insurance company is being harder, a little more recalcitrant in paying, we just file suit and we litigate it and we keep pushing them until they do. So it takes the time, it takes more time, but not necessarily a lesser settlement. So why do you feel like some of those come in at the lower amount, like your fifteen to $20,000 settlements? Is that... What are the factors in that? Is it just low insurance? Is it not enough injuries? It's not, it's not low insurance at all. It's it's a, it's it's a it's a it's a low impact. It was it wasn't. They didn't even get the car fixed, or it's a little dent, and they went to the ER, and then they went to the Cairo twice, and they're done. And so they got two grand in in medical, mm-hmm. and so and even you went to a jury, and and the jury gave you ten grand in for pain and suffering. That's still only a twelve thousand dollar case. So mm-hmm. really has to do with the injuries. There's a lot of fender benders. Or, or lower impact uh, uh, car wrecks where people aren't significantly hurt, thank God. Mm-hmm. Younger people don't get as hurt as, as older people. Uh, we're not, uh, when we're older, we're more brittle. So it's, it's a variety of factors. But it, the bottom line is it has to do with how bad you're, in, how bad you're hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, there you is go. there any tips that you would give for people that, without going through all the motions that if they called you, you know, obviously you go more in detail, uh, but is there any tips that you would give people regarding you know, if they have their own, you, know, you, you can see that it's going to be a 15 to 20 K case. It's not something that you can add value to. Obviously you said you don't want to take anything from that. They could get more on their own. What let's just call it for the sake of time of, of the essence, three tips that you could give people. If you were going to say, you know what, you need to take this as a DIY, do it yourself. What were the, what would your top three tips on that be? Sure. Number one, go get your medical treatment. Get your do your follow up care. Go to the e- urgent or e- or go to ur- urgent care or ER within 24 hours. Then go do some go to your primary care doctor and go to some chiropractic visits. Get mm-hmm. your medical treatment done, um, and then don't settle until your medical treatment's done. Then get your medical so wait till all that's wait finished. till you're done because you don't want to think you're done and then settle it and then go to have to go to the chiropractor for 20 more visits or go to an orthopod and get an MRI in your neck and blah, blah, blah. So, and so make sure you're, you've reached your maximum medical permit. You don't need any more medical. I think I probably gave you two of the three right there. In the okay. Way. All right. So, and then let me just give you a third one. Send them, send the medical bills to the, to the claims adjuster who's calling you to try to settle the case and pick a number. You know, we, we, I settle plenty of cases for 10 and fi- for 15 grand. And not as many for 10. I'll settle a case for 15. We have friends of the firm. I mean, I try to help everybody I can. And, and, and we're not really making money on it, but that's not really. It's about the client, not me. Mm-hmm. Um, but so, so um, and sometimes people say, I don't care. I'm too busy. You handle it. I don't want to deal with it, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, so, but so, so send it to the, them and then ask for some money. Start at it five grand plus medical or 10 grand plus medical or something like that. See what they do. And if mm-hmm. they're playing ball and stuff, and though, can, can I give you my gem? Can I give you sure. my serious? Whatever you want to share. who's listening, you can always say, hey, listen, if you don't settle with me now, I sent you two grand in medical expenses. I want another two grand. I want four grand. And they, they're saying no for $1,000. Say, listen, if you don't settle me for four grand, I'm going to have to call Gary Berger at Berger Law. <laughs> and then I'm going to have to hire him and he's going to do this. I do this to people all the time. I don't even know him. I say, drop my name because they'll Google me. They'll know mm-hmm. all these people know us. We fight a lot. We've got to fight a lot of battles for a lot of years. So they know me and they're like, because they know as soon as I get the case, it's going to add value and it's stupid for them not to. And it shows that the person is D I Y in it 
but they're not stupid mm -hmm. and, and they know what they're doing and they're not going to be a pushover. They're going to stand up for themselves. And then if they don't get satisfaction doing it on their own, that's the, the insurance company is going to force them to a lawyer. What's the biggest thing that you see change once the word attorney or lawyer comes into the conversation? They settle. They do. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when I get when we get involved uh, uh, in cases, the case that, you know, see, even a bigger case, let's say they're, 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 they're talking to a family off from 10, 20, $30,000. We get involved. They're like, listen, this is a $200,000 case every day of the week. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so the value of the case goes up because they also know that, look, there's a lot of other good lawyers out there, but we're, we're very proud of our reputation and not settling for less and insisting that our clients get full compensation for their injuries. Not 50% compensation, but the full compensation for this lifelong injury they sustain. And, and insurance companies don't. And if they're not going to pay us, we're going to file suit. We're going to keep going until till we get it. Cool. So now we've talked a little bit about the average settlement in like a car accident yep. case. So let's lead that into like a general personal injury case. Because in, in layman's terms, a person that's not, you know, infinitely knowledgeable about personal injury as you are, Personal injury can contain a lot of different things. So you know, slip and falls, uh, deck collapses, things of that nature. Um, would you, I, I guess would you also consider medical malpractice? I guess you could in a different sense. But I think it's a personal injury. I think medical malpractice. So obviously car accident, person hits other person or thing and, you know, lots of damage. What would be the, the average in a personal injury settlement? I, I'm going to say the same. I'm going to say 25 grand. I looked at some stuff. Too, mm -hmm. You know, and, and, but I think it's about the same. Now the ranges for a car wreck or a personal injury case, there's 25 grand to a million, mm -hmm. uh, but let's keep it on personal injury cases. So, so you have the high personal injury cases, like more complicated medical malpractice cases or a premises liability. Someone has a hole in the yard, you break your leg or, or a products liability case where it's dangerous product and, and, or a medical malpractice case where Would dog bites fall in that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you know, Personal injury is everything. It's the big umbrella. And under that are the subdivisions like car, tr you know, truck, auto, you got med mouths, you got dog bites, you got, you got, you got your workers' compensation claims too. Mm -hmm. workers' compensation claim is an injury. It's an injury personal to you, mm -hmm. um, pers to a person, not a property. It's just mm -hmm. to distinguish versus property damage or personal or bodily, bodily injury. Claim. And to be clear too, you don't handle personal, uh, Property damage cases. Sometimes we do, but most of the time in car wreck cases, what we tell people is you take care of your property damage because I don't want to take a fee on that. I want you to get all the money. We'll get, we'll help them. We'll write them letters. We'll do that. Mm. But, but you do that. I also, though, sometimes I just was about to try a case two weeks ago and they just, they, 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 they caved where someone has an insurance claim on their house and they won't pay. So we sue the insurance company and say, you ripped them off. They, they, their house burned down, they, you know, Pay them the hundred grand, the two hundred grand. So we've done those cases numerous times. Um, so and, and, you know, we we also do like people have wage loss or others. We do economic injury cases. I've been asked to try a lot of commercial mm -hmm. cases. Um, I had this hundred million dollar wage case that we tried and we got for the Missouri Department of Corrections. So that's a not a personal injury case. It was a wage case, a mm -hmm. wage and hour case. Um, it just to, I think it describes the type of injury and the type of damages that you're entitled to. So on the average for a personal injury case, I think it's around 25 grand, but the range is from five grand to a million or, or above a million because, you know, there, there's a lot of little sprained ankle cases or, or slip on ice and, and fracture your wrist type of cases that are those lower cases. But there's also cases with, you know, product defects that significantly injure people, doctors, careless doctors that are too busy or hospital nurses that they, they just don't care and they miss medication or they don't do it or they're not watching, making sure the oxygen's on or they, you know, all the things that, that can, that can happen in a, in a, in a, in a hospital that's not run well. Mm -hmm. Um, and those cases are bigger cases. So, but on average, I'd say 25 grand. Now, I think my average, again, not to pat myself on the back, I think ours is a little higher because, again, I, I, I let people handle their DYI, your, their own case when it's low. So they're taking the full amount. Yeah, yeah. I'm, mm -hmm. I don't, you know, let them use, drop my name and try to get the five grand for themselves and help their kids uh, because I can add value to the, to the big case. Um, so I think our, and we kind of try to take bigger cases and, and litigate and file lawsuits to push for those settlements. Do you feel like- Higher settlement. Do you feel like when people come to you, they know what their case is worth? 
So yes and no. Great question. Great question, Dave. Um, they think so sometimes they do because th this information's out there. They can Google it. If you start Googling it, you'll get enough. And, and mm -hmm. actually, we put up a, a personal injury calculator on mm -hmm. our website. You and I talked about it. Yeah, and we can link that a, in the video a, too. Yeah, I was a little reluctant, but we did it um, because there's all that information out there, and people should be savvy consumers. <clears throat> of there, it's hard to decide how to choose a lawyer. It's hard to do this. This is a unique area. People are like, I've never come to a lawyer before, so they look at it a little bit. So they'll have some ideas, and sometimes they're right. But also, sometimes they won't appreciate um, nuances of damages. Like there's caps on certain types of damages for the claim. So like of fingers, law. thumbs, foot, toe, knee, elbow, etc. Well, yeah, but so 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 in like in, a, in medical malpractice, there's a cap on non-economic damages. So if you die, you could only get seven hundred fifty grand in Missouri. Mm. Uh, if if it's a non-catastrophic case, it's only about four hundred and forty grand for non-economic damages. In workers' compensation, it's terribly cheap. Now, you can cut off your finger and be limited to like 30 weeks of pay, hmm. uh, the tip of your finger and stuff. So, th so there's caps in work comp too. There's also caps, de facto caps, meaning in effect caps, if someone only has 25 grand in insurance, there's a cap. Um, sometimes people... I have this in wage loss claims all the time. People say, I make this, this, I miss four months of work, da, 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 da. How are you? And if, if, if they're a W-2 employee and they get a check, that's great. But then I say, show me your tax returns if they own their own business. Well, you know, I make that, but I don't quite claim <laughs> that. I go, I said, tell you what, let's see your tax returns. Mm -hmm. That'll inform us as to, as, to the, as to the rate that you're making money. So sometimes and they, they might be entitled not to cut you off, but they might be entitled to some of that as well, because that's lost income. Well, they are. Mm. But sometimes people, it is my experience that people <laughs> sometimes with their own business think that they make more than they do on the books. Interesting. And not because they're doing, I'm not saying anybody's doing anything wrong, but because you know, it's just, you got cash flow and some of your expenses. So I once tried a case where my client insisted on putting his <coughs> wage loss claim up. And he was a trucker and he ran, and he had two trucks. He ran half a million dollars in income through his, through his business. But at the end of the day, he was only paying taxes on 30 or 40 grand because mm. it was gas costs, or right. were all these other costs. Now, the jury hated it. They thought it was bogus that he was that much money was going through, and it kind of was. And I mm -hmm. told him not to. So, <clears throat> again, I'm not judging anybody, but I it is just my experience that when I talk to clients and they say how it, it, if if the, if they're not a, if they're a W two they're exactly on it, and they say I make twenty bucks an hour, I make forty grand a year, and you look at the W twos and it's it's consistent. It's all automated, plugged in. My daughter, yeah. she gave me her stuff for her taxes. She's eighteen. And, and just, and, and it's, we're paying taxes like today or tomorrow, or whatever. Right. And I was like, you only made this, you know, oh, I thought I made more. You know, sometimes you don't make as much as you think, which is okay. It's all good. Um, but people with private businesses, I say, give me your tax returns. And then they go, oh, okay, well, I haven't filed a couple of years or da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. So you got to have that discussion. I've had, but I've also, and I have, I've econ I mean, I'm an econ guy. I was trained as an economist. I'm very comfortable very smart at making economic loss damages. I've done it in highly complex situations involving business valuation, all kinds of stuff. Because you um, never know who's going to get injured if it's someone that's a W-2 or they own yeah, their own business. And, then and that's... they should get, the, and, and, and a business owner should get paid. They mm -hmm. absolutely should get paid. But you just got, but you don't want, when you go in front of the jury, you don't want to look, you don't want to, you know, pigs eat, hogs get slaughtered. You don't want to be too hoggy, okay? You can be a pig, don't be a hog, mm -hmm. right? Or I don't know, whatever the analogy is. Let's get the right analogy when we have Sure, dollar, we, dollar, we can dollar. put it in the subtitles. No, but I mean, I mean you don't want to. I tend to be jur jurors, and people don't like if you're trying to get more than you're entitled to, and we shouldn't. Should we get all we're entitled to? Yes. Should we get 110% of what we're entitled to? No. So we'd want to be measured in our requests for those types of damages, wage loss damages. Makes sense. All right. I have one more before we go into the whole you versus the AI bot. I'm ready. Okay. So Give it to me. last one that I have is what makes a judge fair versus unfair in a personal injury case? Because we've talked about the lawyers. We've talked about the insurance. We've talked about you know clients and their expectations. What, 
and I don't want to get you in trouble with any, you know, judges, but what do you feel like, because you've represented so many, you've been in, in front of so many judges, what do you feel like makes a judge fair or unfair? It's the eye of the beholder. One person's um, free, terrorist is another person's freedom fighter, all right? And that's a bad analogy, but look, look it, so my mom is a judge, was a judge. Mm -hmm. I know many, many judges. I respect for a lot of judges, and every judge I know really tries to be fair and to listen to it. And so it ends up being in the eye of the beholder. You know, you talk, you know, you have the friends who got the divorce. That judge you know, did this to me and blah, yeah. blah, blah. So, 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 you know, so, so remember that. So the judges are trying to be fair. What makes them fair or unfair? Which way the decision went, right? Because of side <laughs> it one. depends who you ask. Oh, he's yeah. the fairest judge I've ever made because yeah. he ruled for me. He rules against you. That guy's totally biased, right? So, so. So there, it's, it's, it's who won, who he ruled for. Now, let's do a one caveat, one exception. Remember that in a jury trial, the judge isn't the fact finder, okay? Mm. The jury's the fact finder. They decide the things, okay? There's 12. That's why we have this amazing jury system in America, in our Constitution, a jury of our peers. We don't, we, a judge doesn't get to decide a, a civil dispute or a crime. It has mm -hmm. to be a jury of our peers because we don't want the judge to have that power. So we have a lot of ways to limit judges' power. There's appeals. Judges get curbed. They get brought to the curb. Judges are human too. Mm -hmm. You know, remember that too. And so, um, so judges, and, you know, as a fact finder, judges have a limited role. Um, but, and, but you got to remember the other thing too, and I, and I know I'm going on, but no, just, it's okay. You know, Let's hear it. Remember a judge not letting you do everything you want to do in a courtroom isn't a bad thing because I've, I've won a lot of trials and sometimes at the end of the, cause then there's less to appeal. So, so I'm trying to do this and cause I'm, listen, when I'm in a trial, I want to win everything. I'm there. I'm there to win it. I'm not there to lose it. And I want to get this piece of evidence and this and this. Sometimes the judge said, wait a minute, you can't get all that evidence in. That's not fair. Or you need a foundation for this. Or you can get this part of the document in, but not the whole document. And then when I win the case, I'm going, thank God that judge wouldn't let me do that because I would have put legal error in my case. And then the other side could have appealed mm. and they would have reversed the case. So sometimes the judge is your best friend. Now, in the moment, you may not get it. You may not get it. But it, when you when you sit back at the end of the day, if you lost the case, or to me, if you won the case, you're like, thank God the judge didn't let me do that because I didn't I don't have any error in my case. Because now. now it's settled, done. There's nothing it's they can done. appeal and, and they done. could potentially prevent. I don't want to call it an error, but like it's uh, called error. It's called legal error. You okay. can call it error because that's what it is. And that's what court of appeals are due because the court of appeals in the Supreme Court is a check on our system. It's a check on the unfair judges. It's a check on unfair lawyers. We have a lot of checks embedded in our system to have a fair, to, to mete out justice, right? And so in the court of appeals to say you had legal error, you were not allowed to let that kind of evidence of wage loss damages in. Mm. You were not allowed to do this. Or this per, this this plaintiff's conviction was 15 years ago. It didn't have anything to do with this case. Don't let it in. Or or the police officer um, didn't have a warrant when they went into this guy's apartment and you know found all the weed under his couch. Well, weed's legal now. Found all the whatever under yeah. his couch, right? So you there's there's rules we have to protect us as Americans because we also have our rights. You have the right to a jury trial, but you also have, but the defendant has his rights too. Mm -hmm. And if I sue a defendant, we want to make sure that I don't go overboard and we need checks in our system to balance that. Okay. So I feel like I've picked your brain for a while now. I think it's only fair to have a little bit of fun with this. Right. So there's this thing that we've heard about across the news, and I'm sure you've brought it up numerous times to me as well, the AI bots, right? In terms of these chat systems, the biggest one that is in use now. Microsoft paid multiple billions of dollars for it, ChatGPT. So what we're going to do now is... Kids from one of the kids from my kid's high school helped develop it. It's, 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 it's genius in a lot of ways, but I think that with your personal experience versus its experience, being able to crawl and understand things, you might be able to, to find some interesting comparisons. Right. So the first one that I'd like to start with, we've got a lot of these, so I'm going to get Great. comfortable. Shoot. I'm ready. <laughs> Bring it. All right. So the way this is going to work nice is, socks, by the way. thank you. I noticed that earlier. Yeah, we, we, we match. Sorry, go ahead. It's all right. So chat GPT, chat GPT. Cool yeah, you got to have cool <laughs> socks for chat GPT. Uh, so the way this is going to work, I'm going to read off the question. I'm going to read its answer first. And then I'd like you to respond to that and see, was it right? Was it wrong? And to use your own words, 
Can you add any value to its response? Yes. Okay. Go. So the first one we're going to put up on screen just so everybody can see these. You don't have to listen to me read. If you read faster than I do, please feel free to look at the screen or if you're on audio, just wait. Uh, how do you know if you have a car accident case? Now, one thing I have to put a note on here is because it can't specifically offer legal advice, we do have to tell it to act as if it was a personal injury lawyer to answer these. So a little bit of a caveat there, but so just for those out there, if you're trying to immediately go to ChatGPT, you have to say, hey, act like you're this. So first question, getting to it. How do you know if you have a car accident case? ChatGPT responds, as a personal injury lawyer, see, it knows what it is now. As a personal injury lawyer, I would evaluate your car accident case by assessing several factors such as liability, damage, and insurance coverage. To term, determine liability, we would need to establish whether the other driver was negligent, and for damages, we would assess the extent of your injuries and related expenses. Insurance coverage would also be considered to determine compensation. Based on these factors, I would advise you on whether you have a viable car accident case and provide guidance on your legal options. So, nailed it or failed it? I'll give it a, I'll give it a D. Okay. Why? Yes, why? Here's why. Because if you're in a car accident, you do have a car accident case, right? Mm -hmm. All right. And, and then look, you know, let, let's talk about liability. Well, what if you're, you, you don't, the other side has to be at fault, but what if you're 10% at fault and they're 90% at fault? We talked so about that. You don't have to yeah. have 100% liability. We have comparative fault. What if you think they're at fault, but the police report doesn't go with you? It says something bogus that you need to fight. So liability is there, great. All right, mm -hmm. but, 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 there, but, but I think that answer could be improved. Then what about the severity of the impact? That's not in here. Mm -hmm. So we have this all the time where if you're in a jury and you see a picture of a crash, you don't see damage, are you going to give someone a million dollars? Probably not. So you need to gauge the severity of the impact with the level of damages and how much you want to get in the case. So I think severity impact and the, and the force equals mass times acceleration, how much force was involved there? Mm -hmm. Damages, yes, you need to have damages, but those are, those are injuries. So how bad are your injuries? How significant are your injuries? So we need to, and, but they're right. You know, we would assess your injuries and related expenses, they say. Well, remember too, that having a lawyer involved the whole time is gonna talk to you about what to do with your injuries. Your neck hurts, your neck hurts, your neck hurts. Well, mm -hmm. should you get an MRI? Should you get an injection too? How does the medicine work so that you can well maintain, but you can also add value to your case? It's very important. You could sit and have the same injury and just doggedly go through chiropractic treatment for two years. That doesn't add value to your case. And I'm probably giving a long an longer answer, but they're missing something on insurance coverage too, because let, you know, remember that you have something called underinsured motorist coverage. So if there's insurance coverage, so first of all, yes, there's insurance coverage. Well, how much? Um, 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 is, is there a low cap? Were there was is there a second policy? Does mm. a person have a have an umbrella policy? And if they only have twenty five grand insurance, what if you pay your premium and you have two hundred fifty thousand in underinsured motorist coverage? So you get twenty five percent from the negligent driver, but you get two fifty from your own policy. So there's various there there's there's various uh, aspects to that that I think they missed out on, but that's okay. It's only Chat GPT. Sure. It's artificial. Well, and one of the things that you mentioned too, I don't think a lot of people are aware of, is that yes, you can pursue the other person's insurance, but what about your own? Yeah, what's your med pay provision? What's your underinsured thing? And or if the other per and then they say uh, it's factors such as liability damage and insurance coverage. Well, what if the defendant doesn't have insurance? Mm. That's okay. What if you have a million dollars in uninsured motorist coverage? So if you get hit by someone who's not insured, you have it. Uh, you've been paying premiums for twenty years. You never made a claim. It's about it's about time you do. So insurance coverage, yes. Well, that's what insurance is for. Broad, <laughs> right, broaden insurance, the idea of insurance, you know, your own insurance. What what do you have? Not just the tort fees, not just the person who injured you or is actively negligent, but but that. So I would I would add those. So we're giving that one a D. Yeah, we'll give that a D. Okay. Because I, I think they missed some stuff, and they also could have talked more, a little bit more about liability damages and insurance coverage. Okay, noted. So we're going to continue on this car accident theme yes. for a moment. Uh, we asked chat GPT, when is it too late to get a lawyer for a car accident? And its response was the answer depends upon the specific circumstances of your case 
and the applicable statute of limitations in your state. In general, it's best to consult with a personal injury attorney as soon as possible after a car accident to ensure that you don't miss any important deadlines in your case. However, if the statute of limitations for filing a lawsuit has not yet expired, you may still be able to hire an attorney to assist you with your case. It's always worth consulting with an attorney to see if they can help you with your case, regardless of time, how much time has passed since the accident. What are your thoughts on that? A, A minus. A, a minus? This is okay. a great answer because they're exactly right. So, because <clears throat> they say you sh it's, it's best to consult with a personal injury lawyer as soon as possible after a car accident. And, that's, and you've said that <laughs> a million it times. Time. Yeah. I say it all the time. You just because you, I'm going to answer your questions for free. My intake people or my staff will we'll tell you whether you need me or not. Mm -hmm. Calling someone doesn't mean you're signing on the dotted line, and I'm not a hard sell guy or try not to be. Um, so, so they're exactly right that, and they're also they also hit the nail on the head that that um, that uh, that there are time limitations after which you can no longer pursue a claim. So it's important mm. to do it right away. So there's you know, sometimes it's a year, sometimes it's two years, sometimes it's three years, sometimes it's five years within like 50 miles of where we sit right now, 20 okay. miles of where we sit right now. All those time limits actually are in the law, depending on the kind of claim you have just for a car crash, not mm -hmm. even for a for general PI case. Now, not to go on a tangent, but does that time limit vary based upon the accident or the injury type? No. Okay. Zero. Zero on the in Oh, let me, oh, I gave myself an okay. answer. <laughs> okay. Yes, on wrongful death mm. in Missouri, you get you only have three years to file a wrongful death case in Missouri. General statute of limitations is is five years for other types of injuries. But if if the injury, whether that's med mal, slip and fall, whatever it is, car wreck, it, it's it's three years. In the, it's so four. so they hit it, and and so so go talk to the lawyer. And but do you want to talk to the lawyer because there are going to be other circumstances that make other parts of your case important, like. You need to get in for this medical. You need to put them on notice right away. You're going to need to start talking to the insurance company. How many times do you think an insurance company that doesn't know, I had this case the other day, um, that doesn't know about a slip and fall for three years and they get a claim and are they going to pay that claim? No. I would where think so. Where are those witnesses? Nowhere. Yeah. Where's well, the video from the store where you slipped? Nowhere. Because part of this is, that, well, actually, the, I guess the minus, can I keep talking? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. The minus here is they, they didn't really talk about the importance of gathering evidence. Mm. What's the witness say? What's this? You know, what's going on? You know, where's the pictures of the skid marks in the car crash case? Where's the picture of the oil on the floor at the grocery store? Where's their the security camera runs, oh, re-records over the same disc every 30 to 90 days. We have this all the time. We mm -hmm. send on evidence preservation letters right away. We do it, and it's and it's a big deal. Is these evidence get well, that I, evidence? I think that would be one of the harder things. Again, another tangent, but the sooner you do it, the easier it would be to collect all that evidence. Because, like you said, skid marks. Well, if you wait a month and it rains a million times in a high traffic area, they're gone. They're or gone. the surveillance footage. You know, if you wait thirty to ninety days or whatever the case may be, or they red light cameras, or or you go or you go. Yeah, all true. You hit it, mm -hmm. or like let's say the way that wait an intersection is timed with a red with a with a left arrow versus a yield on green. Mm -hmm. or something. There's all kinds of stuff we go out and look at, or the or the, or the witness who doesn't remember. I don't remember. Well, that's what I was going to say right? next is the witness is like, hey, remember what happened six months ago? No, I don't. And then when you get in front of a jury and you're deposing that person, it's going to be a lot more difficult for them to account for it persuasively and accurately. I would assume. What's the one thing that insurance companies want to do immediately after a wreck? They want to take your record a wreck. They want to take your recorded statement. Everybody mm -hmm. wants to take a recorded statement because that's fresh in your mind. You remember the details. They want to record it. And down the road, that statement can be used against you. I do it all the time. Is your advice to give a recorded statement or not to give one right away? Usually not, but it depends on the claim. If it's the other side's insurance company, you're going to assume never, ever give a recorded statement. Why? They turn off the recorder. I'll tell you what happened. If it's your own insurance company, if you have a house fire or a water damage in your own house, you have a duty to cooperate with your insurance company. So you are required to give them a recorded statement sometimes. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, do I have to? Where does it say in the policy? They'll show you. Okay, I will then. Yes, I was, I was out to dinner with my wife and our house burned down. What else do you want to know? Right. Um, you know, you know, what, why were all the accelerants? Why didn't I have any gas cans in my house? I don't know. You know but, but I mean, <laughs> right. so you don't just say no and refuse because sometimes you have a duty to cooperate if it's against your own insurance company. Interesting. So your advice would be to make, see if you have that. Call me. 
Okay. Yeah, call, call me. And I, and call I'll, Gary. <laughs> but I mean, you know, don't give the statement. You can tell them, listen, let me, you can say, yeah, I was rear ended. But if it's the other side's insurance or even your, in, your car insurance company, you don't have to give a recorded statement to. Mm. But if you want to cooperate and get underinsured or uninsured, maybe you do. Um, and so, so now the adjuster won't say whether you have to, they'll act like you have to, you have to, but if you say, of you course I will, yeah. this recorded statement, no. Can you just write down what happened? I was sitting at the light and I got rear ended. What else you want to know? So do you ever give the calls on the client's behalf? I give recorded statements with clients. If they insist, it will help my client. I'll get on the phone with them and I'll do it. And I'll just make sure that the adjuster is not playing games. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they don't, sometimes they do, or sometimes they'll forget it. They'll say, you know, you had you had prior you had prior neck or back problems, didn't you? Yes, I did. And then my follow up question is, but that was when you were playing football in high school and you're 50 years old and you haven't had back or neck neck or back problems for 20, for 30 years. Isn't mm -hmm. that true? Yes. All right. So they're trying to create that's a false on the record. recording they're now. Trying yeah. to create a false record. You know what I do with the when it's the other side. So let, if if I'm suing them and they're the tort feeser, and they say, we want a recorded statement of their guy. I say, you give me a recorded statement of your guy, I'll give you, I'll give you a recorded statement of mine. Because mm. I'd love to take a recorded statement of that guy. I'll slaughter him. I'll yeah. establish liability right there, and I'll take my own record. They never have let me in the history of in when you When you years. try to play their game? Yeah, I say, fine, you want to play? Well, two can tango, right? What's mm -hmm. good for the goose is good for the gander. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, you take a recorded statement of my person, I'll take one of yours. The next question I have, and I'm interested to see how chat answers this one because it's a little going a little bit more complex into the nature of injury law. So we asked chat GPT, how do you advise clients on whether to accept a settlement offer or go to trial? And its answer was as a personal injury lawyer, I evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of the client's case and assess the likelihood of success at trial, as well as the potential risks and benefits of accepting a settlement offer. I provide the client with all the necessary information to make an informed decision that is in their best interest. If the settlement offer is fair and reasonable, I would advise the client to accept it. But if it is inadequate, I would recommend going to trial. Ultimately, the decision is up to the client. How do you feel about that? Uh, I will give that a... I'll give it a B. Okay. Because here's, here's what I'd al uh, 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 add to that is that um, it's, it's, you are accepting the risks and benefits of a settlement offer. You need to decide whether a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Mm -hmm. Sometimes could you get more trials? Sure. But are there attendant risks where you could get less too? So you have to balance all those things. But what chat GPT is missing on this one is what if the settlement offer is going to go up before you get to trial still? I do this all the time. I have these conversations, real conversations with clients like, hey, they've offered you 200 grand now. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying we go to trial, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go hire this expert. We're going to go, have, we're going to disclose our expert. They're going to take their, and they're going to see what a great expert they are. And then I think their offer is going to go up to three or 350. Mm -hmm. Or we're going to go ahead and take the video depositions of the doctors so that they know we're really going to trial. And, and I do this all the time. Uh, and, and, uh, 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 Dave, and you know how much litigation and trial work we do, but, but other folks might not. But I'm taking video depositions all the time about getting ready to go to trial, and then these cases settle. Hmm. The, the surest way to have a trial is, oh, this is also not in there. The surest way to have a trial is not be prepared. The, the hmm. way to not have a trial is we do all the work. We're taking, we're, we're filing the motion. We literally had a case scheduled for Monday. They, uh, their offer was 40 grand for years. They offered it. They, we settled this case Friday for $250,000, the policy limit, because we would not accept anything else. Mm -hmm. And we were filing, I have a saying, a motion a day keeps the trial a day. So for about the, th can I give you a secret? Sure. For about the 30 days before a trial, I'm giving the other lawyer something every day. Just mm -hmm. one thing. This day, I'll give them the jury instructions. Just do a motion to eliminate. This is my brief on the, to, to, this is what the jury, is, this is what the voir dire is going to be like. Here's my supplemental muck records. Here's my business record filing. I have all these things I do, and they just get one a day, and they're like, holy shit, I'm not going to go to trial. This guy is going to whoop me. Yeah. And so, so um, what they're missing in this answer is it's more nuanced than this. It is my job to, to 
maximize the recovery, but also do put, the, put in the right work. And you got to know, ChatGPT won't know this, but you got to know the pressure points to push on the other side to have them say uncle and pay you. So policy limit demands, taking doctor's depositions, say, oh, I sell them all the time. Listen, here's the deal. We're, we're, we're two months away from trial. I'm about to go spend 10 grand in, to take three doctor, to two to three doctor's depositions. A doctor's feed, the, tra the, the court reporter, the videographer. We take all these by video. Then we're going to cut our videos and we're going to present them. Then mm -hmm. we're going to play them at trial. So in, in about, t by, by this time next week, the price of poker just went up 10 grand. Mm. You better settle the case now. And lawyers who know what they're doing on the other side, they know that. And they're like, oh shit, he's getting ready. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we need to do that. So there's a lot of gamesmanship the art uh, ideal I, I I I negotiate for a living and the art and what buttons to push as you're heading towards trial maximizes the settlement for the client. So we talked a little bit about where as soon as you mention the word lawyer, things change with the insurance company. What about when you start mentioning the word trial? Great point. And and I tell you, I do this all the time with the lawyers that work for me. They won't give me this deposition. They won't do this. They won't offer anything more than after we filed suit. Blah, 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 blah. My answer is set it for trial. Mm -hmm. we, do, we do motions to set cases for trial all the time. We're done, to, we're done talking to you. Blah, blah, blah. Because the defendant and the insurance company know, the defense lawyer and the insurance company know, ultimately the only power that an injured person has is trial. Mm -hmm. It's not hiring a lawyer. It's not filing a claim. It's not filing a lawsuit. It's trial. Ultimately, they don't have to pay until there's a judgment. And we already talked in another question about the, the, the insurance, co insurance company's duties to the insured. So they have duties to the persons being sued, and they got to act in good faith. And they can't sit in lowball offers all day and make this poor guy go to trial when he just was, he was just looking at his phone because his wife was texting him and he rear-ended someone. Why should he go to trial and risk his house mm -hmm. and an excess verdict over his insurance limits? That's bogus. Insurance companies cannot treat people like that. They do it all the time. They force people to go to trial all the time when they could have settled these cases. Well, and you've talked about, too, just leveling the playing field because when you take a... We talked about, you know, the average person versus multi-billion dollar insurance company. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, yeah. lawyers and, and people that are trained specifically, because I won't go into the, the foil hat conspiracies, but I would assume that you had talked about these adjusters, that they're specifically trained to ask certain things a certain way to try to trick people into saying these things. So do you mind talking about that just a little well, bit ins too? Insurance is, so, you know, the, these insurance companies, their profit margins are huge. You, I, I did an article on this about two or three months ago on the on the profit margins, the billions and billions these pro the insurance companies make over excess premiums, premiums in excess of the claims paid. Can I can I add one other thing yeah. about when it's too late to hire a lawyer that Chat GPT missed? Yes, we we asked a minute ago about when's it too late to hire a lawyer. Here's the other time it's too late to hire a lawyer is if you've signed a settlement agreement, if you settled your case. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about insurance adjusters trying to get you to settle your case without hiring a higher lawyer. The other time, there's statute of limitations, there's other times, but the other time is if, if you get it, if you're talking to the insurance company and they say, sign this release, we'll give you a thousand dollars. That means that you're never getting a dime more in your life for that case. So, so, the other way time is too late to, to hire a lawyer is if you've already settled your case, you may not realize it. You may think, oh, I was just dealing with this nice claims adjuster. She was so nice on the phone. She was secretly sticking it to you. Mm. So that does bring up a, a bit of a tangent question. So if you, let's say you, because you said once uh, you sign that release, saying that, I'm, and the release is basically, we're done, hands off. This is all you're going to get. You're releasing this case from what? From any you're further litigation? All your right. You're releasing them from their legal obligation to pay you in any way. Okay. So my follow-up question to that would be, let's just say in a car accident case, you sign a release. Is there anything related to that at all that you could pursue, or is it all-encompassing? 99% of the time, it's all encompassing. Okay, if, so it's that important. It's that important. Okay. They'll tell if it says a jet. Yeah, they'll do if they if they have you sign a legal document to get a check. That's a release. You're releasing your claim. You don't don't do that. Don't do that until you've talked to a lawyer. They can give you a check, but 
don't sign the release and don't sign a check if in the memos it says full, full release of all claims. You're so th- will they actually put that on the check memo? They will try to trick people like that because that, wow. that's called in the in the law it's called accord and satisfaction. There's some areas of powerful law. Now, was that a knowing release? Maybe not. Can you challenge it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. We had a case where this nice mom got a couple checks, a couple, one, 200, 200, under 500 bucks, two checks. They sent her a release. She did not sign the release. We made a claim. They said, nope, you settled the case. No, we didn't. We filed a lawsuit. They said, you settled the claim. No, we didn't. And we fought this through taking video depositions for trial, like I said they did, hmm. and they turned around and gave us the policy limits of a hundred grand. Uh, and what was it, the initial offer on that? It was it was zero. They said we already gave you two 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 hundred a two hundred fifty dollar check at like one hundred seventy five bucks. They say we already paid you. I'm like no, you didn't. I said where's the signed release? They never she never signed it. Yeah, no duh, because we've been telling you that is no one listening to me, <laughs> but they weren't. So. so- Couple hundred dollars into two hundred fifty thousand. Yeah. Oh, we do that. I have these articles I do from zero to hundred grand, or from mm-hmm. zero to two hundred fifty grand. You've seen them because yeah. you do our stuff. I do them all the time because we get these letters where there's a thousand dollar offer, five thousand dollar offer, and then we wait about a year later when we get that hundred grand or that two hundred grand or whatever it is. It's a, it's a ve- I'm very proud of that work. That's real value added for someone who would have been screwed over by a by a by a a. Um, by a insurance company does not care about them. Mm -hmm. He's only interested in that bottom line, but this is this person's life and it's life changing. It's life changing that amount of money. Well, and two, to get you more broad, um, you know, when you're talking about a whole hundreds and hundreds of people that are geared and trained to just go after this one person, like you, again, not to go back to that uh, statement of leveling the playing field, like they don't have anybody. Uh, representing them. They're getting all these calls and da, 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 da. And you have to do this and you need to sign here and do this. Legal talk, scary threats. You're not going to get anything. Oh, you need this money. How are you going to pay that? Oh, you, that mortgage payment you got to do next week. You're going to lose your house. Mm -hmm. How about if you take this thousand dollars from here and here, doc, you sign this. The other thing is when we sign stuff now, Mm -hmm. click, I agree. And and then click here. Yes. You can sign something on your phone. You think you're just getting a thousand dollar check and you're signing away a hundred thousand dollar claim. You don't know. Wow. Isn't that crazy? I mean, that is we crazy. sign stuff on our phones all the time. Very well, easy. Well, and I sometimes it. it's beneficial, but it can also you be used against people. Don't know. The same way. You don't know. You got to be vigilant about that. So let's go ahead and go with a couple more of these. What's your next question? The next question, we've talked a bit about can you do anything if you are at fault or you're not at fault? So this one is more in line with that line of questioning. Well, thank you. So we asked ChatGPT, my claim with the at fault driver's insurance company was denied. Now what? Its response was, as a personal injury lawyer, my recommendation would be to first review the reason why the claim was denied by the insurance company. This information will help us determine our next steps. If we believe that the claim was denied unjustly, we may consider filing an appeal or lawsuit against the insurance company. Alternatively, we may explore other options, such as negotiating a settlement with the at-fault driver or their insurance company. The most important thing to take is to take action promptly as there are strict deadlines for filing personal injury claims. What are your thoughts on that? Matt. No, no well, good. I mean, you know, some of it, it it's, it's not wrong, but look, it is my view that insurance companies are in the business of collecting premiums and denying claims. They deny claims as part of their modus operandi. That's their MO. That's how they roll mm-hmm. because they know they've done statistics and X percentage of people will never follow up from a denied claim. X percentage of people are never going to hire a lawyer. La, 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 la. And then, and then, and that's their deal. And so they do that to stall. They do that. They'll deny it. And then they want you to call them back because even if they, you had originally taken five grand, even if you're not going to hire a lawyer, now they denied it once, maybe you'll take two grand. Mm. So it's a negotiation tactic. They're trying to get you to settle quickly. Um, before they, before they, before they realize the full extent of your, of your, your injuries, you know, a denial, like, oh, I'm not going to get anything. Oh, I have that mortgage due. Oh, maybe I'll accept. Oh, wait, 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 I'll take that $500. Mm. I know, I know I had, I have a million dollars in medical expenses, but right. So, so, um, and, and, and I disagree with the chat GPT saying, look at the reason for denial. Mm -hmm. You can look at the reason for denial. 
But is that bogus? Is that mm-hmm. part of the MO where they're just giving you, they're lying to you? And they are lying to you. Do They, they don't have a duty to tell you the truth. Mm. That's the other side's insurance company. Right. They're, they don't have a duty to you to say, to, to, to tell you the truth. They don't or tell you anything. <laughs> they don't, or to, or to not lie to you. They can yeah. say, they can say, I have this all the time. We, you had a soft tissue injury. <clears throat> we will never pay for medical after six weeks of treatment because the, the doctors say that it's not correlative. It, it, it doesn't, that's totally lie. Mm-hmm. You know, you had a prior accident 10 years ago for your neck. This is your second one. We don't give a lot of money for a second a- accident. Well, but I didn't need surgery and my bone wasn't sticking out of my neck the <laughs> right. first time. Right. Or, you know, or, or they'll tell you that, um, you know, that, you know, you, you don't get this kind of, oh, you had health insurance pay for your medical. So we don't have to pay for your medical. We only pay health pain and suffering. That's not true. And in fact, your health insurance is going to want to get paid back. They'll have a lien in your recovery, or you're not entitled to get a wage loss damages because your employer paid them because they have a sick time policy. Not true, not true, not true, not true, not true. So, so the, um, uh, so they'll tell you the medical care wasn't necessary. They don't have to pay for medical care because you have insurance, lost wages, uh, and they'll tell you a lawyer is the lawyer. If you go get a lawyer, you're going to have to pay more money because he's going to charge you more. We'll put more in your pocket without a lawyer. Mm-hmm. They'll tell you that they'll dissuade you from getting a lawyer. None of that's true. That's probably I the biggest never, threat to them. Right. I will. Right. I will never take a case if I'm not adding value in my client's pocket after my well-earned fee. Mm-hmm. I won't do it. I'll say, listen, I can't add value to that. You'll make more money without me. I'll only take it if I can do it, and I will show you how we can do it every time. Every so, time. I have a quick so, question that's yep, a, a yep, bit of a yep. tangent. It's not really a chat GPT. I, I was just thinking, as much as you talk about insurance company, what is what is your process like when you're online shopping for insurance? <laughs> I bet it's rough. <laughs> uh, you know, you know, I got it. I got in a car wreck. Uh huh. And I had someone uh, uh, hit and run on, and I have a really fast car, so it was stupid for them to hit and run. So yeah. they hit me on, uh, and I I chased them, and I'm calling my wife, and she's like, "What are you chasing that car for?" So I stopped. <laughs> yeah. But I got out, and I took the picture of the person's. I, they were at a light, and I got out. I was like, "What are you doing? Why are you leaving?" I took a picture of her license plate. Anyway, I ended up suing her. Mm-hmm. She didn't, you know, don't hit a lawyer and run away. No. <laughs> I was going to say it's the and worst so thing I you could do. Her, I got service I and I got a judgment against her. I made an under and she had no insurance. Mm. I made an uninsured claim. That's against probably why her. they tried to run. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And I made an uninsured claim against my own insurance company and they paid me and they, they dropped me. So I went out and shopped and I'll tell you something. And I tell this to clients all the time. Um, I'm one of these people that if I get someone, I just kind of stick with them. So I had an insurance company for 20 years. I make one claim and they cancel me. I'm like, mm. are you kidding me? But when I went out and shopped it, even post making a claim, I paid less. Yeah. Because because it's like the cable company. When it, remember you used to phone bill, cable, cable company. Phone yeah, bill, yeah. There's always charge, a better deal. Whoever, yeah. There's always a better deal. And someone's having a special and someone's doing this. So I actually packaged it. I got better homeowners. I packaged it. Package your insurance with your car and your home. If you own a home or renter's insurance or package this insurance because they'll give you a better deal, give you multiple vehicle discounts to do that. So now then I switched insurance companies and I saved money. I paid less and I, I made the claim and I, I got a, I settled my claim. I got 25 grand for my un, for my uninsured claim. Well, it's interesting too. Like they don't, they're under my no lawyer charged me a third though. <laughs> Did he? No. Uh, it's interesting too, because they're not under any obligation to say, Hey, this is a better rate or this is a better thing. I just a simple analogy. You know, when I switched over my phone recently, I went in and I said, Hey, this is a plan I'm on. This is the phone I'm looking to get. And they said, Oh, well, you're paying too much. What do you mean? It was $40 cheaper just because I went in there and Every visited. Time they yeah. do that. Oh, you, you qualified for this. Well, I, how come you didn't call me three years ago and tell me that? Right. They'll never do that. Never do that. Never do it. And you know, people are worried. They'll say, Well, I don't want to. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to make a claim against my un- under. I don't want my premiums to go up. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, listen. So that's, yeah, so number one is if you switch insurance companies, you're, you're going to pay the same price or less because you're, you're shopping it. You haven't right. shopped that in a long time. And the other, and the other thing is, is that why would you forego a hundred thousand dollar injury claim that is tax free to you mm-hmm. for $50 an extra a month? Do the math. You is have it, to, you have to live your whole life. Is it illegal for them to increase your premiums after you file a claim no. or they pay one out? No. Should it be? Maybe. You don't, you don't want to have predatory pricing, but, you know, you know the, the rules, are the, each 
the rules on insurance companies are pretty lax. We don't have the enforcement mechanisms to make sure they're not ripping people off. I've tried some class action suits against insurance companies before to try to get them to behave Mm -hmm. and to act like they should, and it's hard to do. Uh, uh, um, But there are regulators. They do look at it. They do look at rates. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they got to be competitive. So it's what the market will bear. So if that's the thing, and that's what I mean about look around, because what if you're with X insurance company and they're ripping you off for all those years or your cell phone or something, go somewhere else. You're like, oh my gosh, look how much money I save. <clears throat> so make a claim against your own insurance company. That's why you pay the pri- That's why you pay the premiums. So we've talked a little bit about the person at fault, suing your own insurance, underinsured insurance companies, other lawyers, judges. What about if you're going after like a company? So you, not just cars, you had mentioned earlier, uh, this massive truck that was you know, 75,000 pounds slamming into somebody, mass impact problems, right, injuries. Uh, so with insurance, obviously the trucking company has to have insurance. So this is another question we asked ChatGPT is, when is a trucking company liable for my truck accident injuries? So I'm going to give you their response, and yep, then I'd like you to break that down. And then I'll grade them. So as a personal injury lawyer, a trunking company may be liable for your truck accident injuries if they were negligent in some way. This may include failing to properly maintain the truck or failing to properly train or supervise the driver. Additionally, the trucking company may be held liable if they were found to have violated federal regulations governing the trucking industry, such as hours of service rules or weight restrictions. It's important to consult with an experienced personal injury lawyer who can review the specifics of your case and determine if the trucking company may be held liable for your injuries. Did you get a nail or fail on that one? You gotta, you gotta, it's, it's in between like all of these are, mm-hmm. it's not a fail. Cause they, they hit some good stuff. It is very true. Companies have to maintain the truck. They got to train their drivers, but if they don't do it, they're still liable. It's called responding at superior. If, if you're working for a company and you're negligent and you injure someone, the, you're you're liable, but also the company you're working for is. It's mm. been the rule. It's been the law in America forever. Uh, so we hold co- we hold organizations accountable for their people, and 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 so they're missing that in here. It's a big gap. I mean, you could drive a truck through that. Uh, <laughs> through so, the gap. So, so so and 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 so that's a big deal. So we always sue the trucking company. And we always sue the driver. And frankly, at the end of the day, we'd probably rather have the trucking company there instead of the driver Mm -hmm. they're automatically the company's responsible for all the driver's negligence all of it all Mm -hmm. of it if they got the placard on their uh, so so there you go so Mm -hmm. we always make the trucking company liable they're liable no matter what because it was their driver but there also is additional layers of responsibility if they never i could tell you stories dave Mm -hmm. they never trained them the guy just Mm -hmm. got out of school they didn't give them, they, they didn't, they didn't check the brakes. They didn't make them do, 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 they didn't make them adhere to all the regulations. We've had cases where the guy didn't have a CDL. We've had cases where they weren't keeping their, their driver's logs. They're driving more than 11 hours a day. Well, you know, you know, truck trucks. So trucks are um, 20 to 30 times the weight of a vehicle. You know, they're 75,000 pounds. They take, they take 30 to 40% longer to stop because they're so heavy. Mm-hmm. Um, they have different kinds of brakes. They have, there's all kinds of stuff going on with these trucks. They have a lot more mass. They also travel a lot of miles on the road. So they're mm-hmm. more, you know, they're more likely to get in these crashes. Um, um, and there's just a lot of mass and there's a lot of great truckers, truck drivers out there. I've represented a lot of truck drivers actually mm-hmm. a lot in, in who get injured because of this, that, or the other thing This truck, we have truck, truck crashes all the time mm. and that kind of stuff. But at the same time, we also sue, sue truck drivers when they don't, you know, and, and there's a lot of things and, and there's a highly regulated industry. There's national trucking guidelines, federal, unlike for cars, federally, there's national regulations. The good news is they either have to have 750 or a million dollars insurance, every truck out there. So insurance isn't really the issue unless it's a real calamitous and a number of dead folks, which is, it happens a very sad. We read about it all the time, you know? Um, and, uh, um, but they have to, they have, they, you know, if it's bad weather, they, they have to put more space between them and the car in front of them. And, you know, driving to work, I was driving to, I took a deposition of a truck driver on Friday. I was driving to work this morning. There's a, there's a track, track trailer right on me. They mm. have to put more space. Are cars going to move in during traffic in front of them? Yeah. 
That's the deal, though. You got to put because you because because you're if you're a tractor trailer, you're seventy five thousand dollars pounds. You you can't stop in 20, 30 feet. It takes you longer to stop. So there you go. So th- th- so they're missing a main reason why you you sue the trucking company. They got some of it right, but <clears throat> you know we have a lot of other videos on the website, a lot of stuff about how we show trucking companies are liable. There's all these regulations and rules of the road for a reason. Mm-hmm. They're there for a reason because they save lives and, and, and we're going to hold them accountable. So there so you I go. So I have a bit of a tangent on that question yep. too, because you had mentioned that there's different federal requirements for trucking companies they have to follow, yep. but I want to go on a tangent about commercial vehicles. So let's just say, you know, Tom's fence company slams in his F-150 or, you know, even a big truck, let's call it like a F-3500 or, you know, or a bigger truck. Yep. Right. Have them uh, all the time. Right. So is there anything that's specific to commercial accidents in general? Because you had talked about the trucking companies, you can go after the driver and the company. Is that also the same for a, a smaller business yes. that's not a commercial semi truck? In a word, yes. Okay. So, so, the idea that the employer is responsible for the employee's negligence is true no matter whether someone's in a tractor trailer, over the road tractor trailer. And, th- and those tractor trailer regulations are only interstate, state to state. If mm, you cross okay. the board in the state, the federal government gets the authority to regulate. But if you're local, if it's your Tom's Fence Company, you're not going over. You're just staying in Missouri and right. in Wildwood or West County or Jet, wherever you are. Mm-hmm. And, 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 but you're, so the employer's still liable, okay? I would assume for both the employee and the equipment, meaning the and vehicle. And the equipment, and yes, and, and they're liable. And they, they should carry really good insurance. And if you're over a certain weight, you're going to have requirements to do that. So for Tom's Fence Company to do business with different counties, governments, different, employ, different, different customers, they're required to have certain levels of insurance and levels of bonding. Mm. So hopefully those people have good insurance, and they usually do. Now, there's a lot of other questions that are attended to this. We've represented a lot of people who are driving the commercial truck. They're driving for the uh, Tom's Tom's employee. What if he? What if it's not his fault and he gets hit? Mm. Does he go after his own insurance or the commercial insurance? Mm. Does he work, make a work comp claim or doesn't make a work comp claim? Okay, interesting. So, so those are some good. Well, questions. it's interesting too because like these are all the things that a lawyer would think of that <laughs> the average person we just get wouldn't. Them every day. Yeah, we, we do. So so uh, so we we get the, we get these literally every day. We, mm-hmm. we get them all the time because, you know, we're, you, you want the guy to go get comp because his employer provides comp insurance, but comp's really cheap. And a lot mm-hmm. of times those doctors are paid to shade the case in the employer's favor. So they won't give you the level of disability. If you go they to the work comp doctor. It. Yeah. Right. So sometimes we say, listen, the person that, so the person that hits you has a lot of insurance. Don't go on comp. Go on for your health insurance. Go do this, this, and this. We, we had a case, literally, this is like, we have this every day. My client that has an underinsured motorist coverage because the person that hit him didn't have a good insurance. Mm. So we got underinsured. So we have underinsured policies on his personal policy and on the commercial policy. He works for the company. And I have a lot of friends who own companies and they have me help their employees or I have a lot of friends who work for companies. So, so uh, anyway, so we, we (laughs) made an underinsured claim against both. Yeah. It's because those are two separate contracts. He pays, he, you know, so, so usually if you're working for your, your boss, um, um, then, and you're driving, then the commercial policy is going to take precedent over your individual policy. Most of the time, a person who has your own car insurance, they're going to have an exclusion under their policy. That says if you're driving for work, or if you're driving, mm. if you're working for someone who has another policy of insurance, this is not covered. But if you're working for someone that doesn't have a commercial policy, then maybe like people, like if someone in my law firm, if someone is in my law firm and is going out to court for me and they get in a wreck, am I liable? Mm-hmm. Is my is my firm liable? I don't know. I hope not. It hasn't really happened. <laughs> Tell them drive safe. But they kind of are. Yeah. But it's also their vehicle and their insurance. So Well, I would imagine <laughs> that the commercial limits due to be them driving more, the the limits would also be higher on those, I would think. Those are higher. You know, yeah, the increased activity, increased risk. And the the company is going to have a general commercial umbrella policy. Usually, They'll say 100, 250 or whatever our limits on our car. But if and if you sue and then we have an umbrella policy, general commercial policy, it also acts as an umbrella of a million dollars or five million dollars or something like that. Good answer. (laughs) So we sue the trucking companies all the time and and we, we very frequently settle those cases. Okay, so. 
obviously you've talked quite a bit about how you handle cases. Now, I think it's fair to say not everybody shares your passion for justice and getting people the correct amount of compensation that they deserve. So let's just say you have someone that is currently being represented by another firm and they've already hired, they've signed the contract or whatever the, the paperwork is and they're not happy with their personal injury lawyer. Let's say it's taken forever. Let's say that it's, they're just giving them bad advice. You get kind of a feeling like, I don't know if this guy has my best interest or gal, best interest in mind. Can a person, and this is a chat GBT because again, we're comparing things. So I would like good, your general good, information, good. but I'd also like, chat, can, can you fire your lawyer? Can you fire? Well, let's talk about, let's keep it specific to personal injury lawyer, or if you want to go on a no, tangent no, with you your answer. Me, you tell me the question. So, Give me chat GPTs and let me we see. We asked it. chat GPT. Yes. Can I fire my personal injury lawyer and hire you instead? Did they say not if it's burger law? No, not yet. All right, go ahead. <laughs> we haven't got that I far. Interrupted. Sorry. The firm I hired rarely communicates with me, and I get the feeling my claim isn't important to them. We'll get into that. <laughs> I'm sure you have some, some cases where people have came to you. So let's, let's talk about their answer first. Go ahead. So this is in the voice of a personal injury attorney, so we could get a good answer from them. As an experienced personal injury attorney, I understand that communication is key to any successful attorney-client relationship. If you're not satisfied with the level of communication and attention you are receiving from your current law firm, you have the right to terminate your relationship with them and seek representation elsewhere. However, before making any decisions, it's important to carefully evaluate your current situation and ensure that switching attorneys is the best course of action. If you do decide to seek new representation, I'd be happy to discuss your case and evaluate whether I can provide the legal assistance that you need. It's interesting how it did a generality and then it got personal. It got personal. And, and I'd give it a C. Okay. I'd give it a C. It, 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 again, chat, what Chat GPT said is not inaccurate. It's not wrong. But the reality is, is when someone is driven to the point of having to call another lawyer behind their other lawyer's back, mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff going on. It's right. usually highly stressful to them. And and every single time I get a call like that, that person has called their current lawyer 20 times and can't get a phone call back. Mm -hmm. And they're really at the end of the rope. I and mean, we get cases where the case is four years old and stuff. So so um, the, the things that I would add to that answer are, so it's not a, it's not, a, they, it's correct. But the things that I would add to that answer are that, well, if it's soon in the claim, don't fire your lawyer. Give them a chance. Every time mm -hmm. I get a call like that, I say, who's your lawyer? If I, and then I go, how long it's been? Mm -hmm. And if it's been two months and these people, you know, you're not being very fair to your lawyer. Stick with your lawyer. And then if it's a lawyer I know, I, I'll say, stick with your lawyer. He's a good guy. If it's a, anyway. But you also, you know, like, like any, any other there are good SEO companies and there are mediocre SEO companies. There are good plaintiff personal injury lawyers and there are mediocre plaintiff personal injury lawyers. Or there's also lawyers that are mostly real estate lawyers and do a little PI on the side. They don't know it like we know it, right? So, so, so there you go. So the things to look for is how long your claim is and, and are they communicating? So I sit on some ethics committees because I also give service to the bar mm -hmm. and try to improve lawyers' reputations. The two most complaints of ethics rule violations for lawyers, like 85% in only two rules, diligence and communication. How quickly are they working on your case and how well they're communicating to you? Mm -hmm. so, so that's what we look at. How are they communicating? And, say, and, and I, we had one the other day. I've been emailing them every day. For, and they showed me the emails. They're, they're ignoring the lady. And I'm like, well, you know what? I'm sorry, but yeah, I would fire him too. Because why are you going to pay that guy to ignore you? It's kind of insulting, mm -hmm. you know? And then the also the other thing is diligence. You know, there's you know, you know, we talked about in one of our other questions, we talked about stale claims. Well, it's important to go out, take the pictures of the skid marks and do these other things, but you also got to go write the letter to the claim rep. You got to file suit. You can't just because if, if a statute of limitations is five years generally for personal injury, I mean, I've never had a case older than two years in my firm where the lawsuit's not on file. I don't care what's mm -hmm. happened. I don't care if they're still treating. Sometimes it's sooner than that. So you gotta, you know, you know, um, justice delayed is justice denied, right? And so if someone's with a lawyer and they're not doing shit for a long time, get rid of them and go to someone else. Now, the one, the good thing Chet GPT said is think about it before you do, because there are mm -hmm. consequences to leaving a lawyer, because you are breaching a contract. You're terminated a contract. You cut a deal with that other lawyer. You may have good reason to, but that's what you're doing. 
you're, you're, you're breaching a contract and you have obligations to that. That other lawyer may try to get part of a fee from you. Now, if mm. they have any pride, they wouldn't. And, but I fight that for them. So, so, you know, when we get a call like that, we, we, if it's, if it's, if it's unfair to the other lawyer, we say, stay with your other lawyer. I don't care if it's a, you know, you gotta be fair. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta have respect to my, to my peers. And I do we have mm-hmm. a lot of good lawyers out there. And, um, and you know, maybe the, maybe the client was having a bad day you know, maybe, maybe they really like their lawyer, but they are just having a, everybody has a bad day. Mm-hmm. So, um, so, uh, so we look at that, we look at the lawyer, we do that. And then, and we'll say, well, listen, you got to fire him first. And if you fire him, I'll come and bring your file. Look at it. Cause you also don't know why is it hung up? Blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. I get the calls too, where I'll say, they'll say, I want to fire my lawyer. Why? Well, he only got me a hundred grand. I'm like, <laughs> what? And then you, and you say, well, and then I said, and I, and I said, well, listen, it's only a hundred grand to get. And that's yeah. a pretty good settlement. And I know that lawyer is a good, hardworking lawyer. She's a great lawyer. You should maybe take that. So, so that happens. Um, but, 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 and, and, and just to, just to bring it home a little bit, but if you have a case where you've been sitting around for a long time and you're not getting any money, you're not, you're the, you feel that the client, that the lawyer um, isn't returning your calls, they're disorganized or unprepared. Mm-hmm. They don't seem to understand your case. They're not listening to what you want. You feel like you're talking to a brick wall. That's not good. And I, and I, and I wrote some of these down because we have this on our website. Or what if they engage in some unethical behavior? What if they committed legal malpractice? What if they blew the statute of limitations and wrote you and said, oh, your case is uh, seven years old and I didn't mm-hmm. do anything? Or a lack of dedication, or you don't think they're going to get it done, or they're or they're trying to take the easy money. Mm-hmm. You know, you know. It, let's say you got a hundred grand, ca- hundred thousand dollar case, and the lawyer is saying, "Take twenty grand, take twenty grand, take twenty grand." And mm-hmm. you know, the hard money is getting it to, from twenty grand to hundred. It's easy to get twenty grand offered in a hundred grand case. It's hard to get them from twenty to hundred. And you got to file suit, do litigation, blah blah blah. All the things we do every day in my firm. Well, and we had talked about too, like how important it is in the very first couple of months to make sure everything's being done. If they're not, I, I would agree and disagree with a couple of different parts, you know, maybe just from a, let's say a potential client's standpoint versus a lawyer, I would say, you know, those first couple of months would be critical. Uh, and if they're not doing all the things they do in those first couple of months, it's like, well, this is evidence being left on the table, as you had said. So I, I, I would say, it's, you know, I'm not disagreeing outright, but I would say, I think generally speaking, you would know pretty quick if somebody's worth their salt. You go through three or four, five, six months. And it's like, you're sending, like you said, eight emails. And it's like, seriously, <laughs> you know, at some point in the, you know, eight months in, maybe they don't have those skid marks there. They don't have the witness testimony. They don't have the recordings. That might be something where it presents a problem. Yeah. Yeah. No, that does. And if the lawyer's not getting that evidence, that's a big, big problem. But on the other hand too, you want to make sure that the client isn't being, isn't jumping ship too quick. Mm. You got to give that lawyer a little bit of a, and, and so, sometimes, you know, I, I, the, the other thing I'll do is I'll say, can I call that lawyer for you? <laughs> and I'll call the other lawyer. I said, what are you doing, man? Yeah. And they'll say, oh shoot, I forgot it. Or I didn't do anything. Or listen, Gary, can you, can you take this case for me? And we'll co-counsel, mm-hmm. we'll work something out, but I'm, I don't know have the bandwidth to do it. I thought I did, but I didn't. Uh, sometimes, but, but yeah, you could, you can lose evidence of omission and I've had it happen. I mean, I've been like, oh man, this case would have been made, you know, you know, the, these, some of these times they, they, they write over these, uh, the security, the security footage, then you mm-hmm. have the video and you can't prove the case. So that does lead me to another question because you had talked uh, a couple of different times about maybe they don't have the experience, uh, they're good lawyers, but maybe it's something they don't specialize in. So you said like real estate lawyers that take personal injury cases, et cetera. You know, what, what's the unique advantage? Because there's a lot of general practice firms, specifically, you know, when you go out further into rural areas, you know, the, the population's lower. So it's like you got this lawyer doing real estate, work comp, PI, family law. What's, what's one of the advantages of having a, a firm that only does PI, car accidents, truck accidents, and the like? What, what's an, a unique advantage that your firm or another personal injury firm um, would have over a law firm like that? Well, this, the, it's, it's never our first rodeo. We've mm-hmm. done it before. We've, 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 we've wor- and we also work to hone our talents in that area. We know all the traps. We know where they're laid. We know what, tr- we know what the tricks are going to be. We know how to navigate the case through 
all the traps that are going to be laid before they're ever laid, before you even know. We'll tell you what to do and what not to do. We'll tell you what insurance to use in this. We'll, we'll, we'll identify the right insurance companies. There's so many things, Dave, it's even, it's even hard to answer because are you, are, you, are you getting all the insurance? Are you figuring out all the parties? Are you getting all the evidence from the get-go? Are you getting the video? Are you coordinating the right treatment with your client or make sure they're getting to the right doctors, dealing with their, with their personal health insurance? Are you notifying their own insurance companies in case there's a, there's a problem with insurance later or too little insurance for underinsured or uninsured or other things? When you're settling a case, are you finding all the policies? Are you making them do an affidavit or are you filing suit to make sure that's all the insurance? Or are you just trusting that there's only 25 grand? Is there really a million dollar umbrella? Um, um, are you believing the line of, of, of uh, the storyline from the defendant, how it was all the plaintiff's fault? No, it wasn't. You know, the plaintiff reacted in seconds the best the way that they could. And this truck driver drove for three weeks without, you know, without marking it, without doing anything as logs or the, or the store owner had that hole on their property for years before that. And there's just a lot of things we do that only a personal injury lawyer knows. And then ultimately your, your value in the case comes from your right to a jury trial. And the advocate for the for the personal injury lawyer has got to be someone who can go and try a case and, and land these planes, land these cases mm -hmm. and get the money, meaning get verdicts. Do they, do they try cases? Do they try cases like this? This is not their first time. We try cases. We, we go to court and we get it if the insurance company won't voluntarily pay. So, and that gives us, so, you know, and I've lost cases too. Whenever I, if I've ever lost a case, I've like, well, I increased the value of all my other cases because they know I go and try the hard cases and we do. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a huge amount of, there's a lot of reasons why to go with a personal injury lawyer. Versus a general firm. Versus a general lawyer, yeah. Cause there's, and I get calls and I do CLEs and I help general lawyers all the time when they have questions. And, and negotiate liens. Once you settle the case, how are you going to negotiate the liens? How do you do this? How do you do that? How do you make sure that when the person gets the money in their pocket, they're not going to have bill collectors after them down the line? The case is really over. What about the release? What if you have multiple parties as a defendant? What if you have multiple plaintiffs and a limited pot to go after? Mm -hmm. What if you, there's a lot of what ifs, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years. You think no case is the same. Mm -hmm. Every case, you must have this with SEO problems sure, and stuff. Yeah. There's no cookie. You think if you could just cookie cutter this and everything would be the same, you could <laughs> sit back on your couch. I could see, you know, and yeah. the problems and the marketing things you and I have, have surmounted because time things change over time. That's the other thing with the, with not a PI lawyer, what, what about the latest tort reform? What about this provision in the insurance company? What about the latest case that says they can't do this? There's a whole host well, of stuff. Well, it's interesting too, because you had mentioned like the other cases, it's like, well, you know, in, in movies, you hear this a lot, you know, they go in the court and it's like, oh, and this versus this, there's this unique clause or whatever that was in, it created for that unique case. And I would think if you're more in tune with that industry specifically versus all encompassing, you'd be aware of those. On the drive over here, I was talking to a SLU law professor mm -hmm. and giving him advice on settling a case. And I was quoting law to him about a weird immunity issue that I knew. And, and we talk about that all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so, and lawyers share that. And, you know, I'm on the list service. I work a lot of time. I, work, I spend a lot of time honing my legal talent. So I sit there and work on my, I work on myself. You know, you think, you know, you're I'm like, you're in your 50s, you don't have to work on yourself anymore. You do, you know? So I work on my legal talent. We do, we do seminars, I give speeches, I work on trials, I do all kinds of stuff to, to make my, my razor's edge as sharp as it can be when I'm fighting the other side. Well, I've noticed that too, like even at my own age, you know, I'm not as old as you, but as a younger man, you know, it, it almost becomes... It's, it's more exciting to learn more things, but it's also more difficult because you have more to sift through. <laughs> you know, it's like you have more, it's like, okay, well, if I had 50 different tangents or options on this thing, well, you know, as you gain five years, 10 years, okay, now I have a hundred different things that I'll have to collaborate to make this idea. And, and let me add something that people don't realize is the, the simplest case wins. Mm -hmm. So when you have this case and all these facts, when you have experience, like this, you know what's important and what's not. It's like that Nate Silver book, The Signal from the Noise. I mean, it's or dealing with, you gotta, you gotta pick what's important because you can't put on everything the jury will be bored to tears. And the other thing is you need to know what pressure points are on the other side to push mm -hmm. to get them to pay the money. And I know that, I do it all the time, do it every day. And I tell them, 
you're the Lord. Here's what I'm going to go do. Tell me when you're ready to pay. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, okay, cool. So we've talked for quite a while now about offers. And it's becoming apparent that the majority of the time, the insurance company is not going to give you something out of the box that's fair and in your best interest. So one of the questions that we asked ChatGPT, and I'd like your input on is, how should I respond to a lowball insurance settlement offer? And its response was, if you receive a lowball insurance settlement offer, it's important to resist the temptation to accept it right away. Instead, carefully review the offer and compare it to the actual cost of your medical bills, lost wages, and other damages. If the offer is significantly lower than what you believe your claim is worth, you can respond with a counteroffer that reflects your actual damages. Alternatively, you can choose to reject the offer and continue negotiating with the insurance company or even file a lawsuit if necessary. In any case, it's important to have an experienced personal injury attorney on your side who can help you navigate the settlement process and advocate for your best interests. What are your thoughts on that? Great answer by Chat GPT. Yeah, it this, really is. This I is think an A plus. A minus. Okay, A minus. All right. I don't give out many A's because there's <laughs> things they're they're leaving out, but mm-hmm. they're really exactly right. And and you know. What, don't accept it. Don't accept it. Now, the area where I don't think, I, th- I think they're when they're talking about negotiating, okay? So, so you, there's, there's other things you can do that chat GPT. Why are they offering a low amount? What's their reason? Is it they're putting pressure on you? They're ignoring evidence? They're saying things that aren't true? Get the evidence. See if you can convince them, okay? Hire a lawyer. You know, when when we don't settle a case, we file a lawsuit. When we file a lawsuit and they won't, they won't, they give us a little ball offer. We try the case and we show them. You know, um, uh, we keep going till we till we persuade them of the wisdom of our position. Sometimes they ignore it all the way until it's right at the end. You can go out and you can get you can gather evidence. I I have have had clients come in and say, here here's the video of the cycle of the lights at this intersection. There is no arrow. That person never had an arrow. It doesn't exist. It's just, it goes from green to yellow flash, and it was yield, left-hand turn the whole time. You can gather evidence. You can do that stuff. You can also say, you know, things like, hey, you know, here's why the police report was wrong. Here's the pictures of the skid marks. I didn't have any medical for 10 years, that kind of stuff. I'll give you my primary care physician's records for 10 years. There's nothing in it. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can hire a lawyer, you can you can negotiate if you have a number in mind, or you can just ultimatum then say, listen, you said this, but I want this, give it to me. You go to a lawyer, hire a good lawyer, file a lawsuit, and litigate it, and keep going. Because it's the, 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 the numbers always get bigger as you go along. I mean, the clients want to settle the case soon, but I say, listen, we get more money if we're pushing them to trial sometimes. So, mm-hmm. Well, one of the things I think it, it, that it leaves out is, what is a lowball offer? Like, because, you know, you, we said earlier in this conversation, you were talking about you know, somebody said, oh, I want, you know, 100 grand. Well, maybe you only have 100 grand. Maybe it's not a lowball offer. <laughs> maybe it's the offer that you want. Or maybe, yes, and, yes, true. And maybe you want 100 grand, but you have 10 grand in insurance and in medical expenses, and that's it. Mm-hmm. And you're fine. And the, they and the, and the insurance company's like, we try cases in this venue all the time and no one's getting verdicts like that because it's way too much. You're being unrealistic Mm -hmm. or this. And, and, you know, sometimes, you know, you know, it's just, it's just, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to be empathetic, you know, Mm -hmm. it's empathy versus sympathy. And, and although it's very big to you, maybe in the scheme of things, it's not big. Maybe you're partially at fault. Maybe there's no property damage in your rec case. Mm -hmm. Maybe the whole that you fell in was open and obvious to everybody, and there was a big orange cone right next to it. <laughs> you walked around. Yeah. Maybe I had a case one time where my my girl and I know a couple other cases. I slipped. Was there any cones? No, no, no. We got the video case, and she literally went around like three <laughs> wet floor signs. To, I'm like, how did you make it there through the <laughs> wet floor signs? And she slipped and fell, but it was totally your fault. So there's comparative fault. There's fault issues, there's other stuff. Well, I definitely think, you know, in a future video, we're going to have to have a compilation of all the best stories because <laughs> I'm sure you got some good ones that will be interesting. We stories. We yeah, stories. Yeah, yeah. So I do have a, a, a bit of a lead-off question, Gary, because I don't, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, and this is one that isn't necessarily uh, chat GPT because we talked about so much, you know, about your own personal experience, what it's like to be an attorney, what it's like to be on the other side, to hear all this stuff. And like you said, try not to store it in the most difficult case, you know, and 
in, in, in the world of lawyer jokes, you hear all these different things. Um, and you guys, it's even the description, it sounds like you guys go through a lot. So, you know, what do you wish more people knew about like you or your profession? I, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, I, for me, I wish people knew more, and we talk about it and stuff, but how hard I work at being a great lawyer and being a great trial lawyer. I spend mm -hmm. so much time doing it. It's my passion. I've been doing it for so long. I'm doing it at night, weekends. I'm always reading things. I'm, you know, you just look around the world like, hey, how could I use that to help? And you're also trying to check yourself. You know, wait a minute. I got to give good advice to that client. I can't do it. Wait a minute. They want me to do this. You know what? I got to tell them. The hard advice, you know what? You don't want to do that. I get more thanks for the for when I tell people no or they can't do it or this is going to be too hard. And later they say, you know, I didn't want to hear it, but thanks for telling me that. So you got to, and so you got to honor being a lawyer, get putting the client's interest first, giving them candid, straight lawyer advice. So I work hard at that. Um, and I, and I, and it's hard to get through. It's an intangible. It's an intangible. Mm -hmm. No one wants to, everybody works hard. No one wants to say, oh, I work hard, blah, blah, blah. But it is true, and we, I really take it to heart, really take my duties as a lawyer to heart, which is dovetailing into what I would say about the profession. I wit, you know, that lawyer, it's, you know, the lawyers' jokes are a joke, you know, and lawyers are their own worst enemy. The lawyer stories you see about the guy stealing money from his clients or doing a terrible job or not returning calls or we can, lawyers give themselves their, 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 own, their own bad rep and a few apples few bad apples ruin the whole bunch mm -hmm. um, and get and, and get and get uh, blown out of proportion. But I wish people knew the degree to which the bar regulates itself, the, the, the degree to which lawyers and judges work really and law schools work really, really hard to make sure that practicing licensed lawyers are regulated and overseen. And we require 15 hours a year in legal classes. We we have ethics complaint procedures. So if a lawyer is doing something wrong, you can complain about it. And there's a vigorous system. I'm a part of that system where, where we investigate it, we look at it, we, 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 we either, we hear the lawyer's side, we take, we take the, we look at these things and then we either give them ethics violations or admonishments or they get taken to, taken up to the Supreme Court. So the, the, it's not perfect and lawyers don't regulate themselves perfectly. Mm -hmm. But in terms of a profession that is not federally licensed, like doctors, you know, FDA or or pharmacists or stuff, for a a a practice, a a, a profession, um, I think in 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 the states I practice and in all states, the the bar the the bar uh, really does a good job in regulating itself and trying to maintain the integrity of the profession. Jerry, I. Don't think I could ask for a better answer than that. If I've taken up so much of your time, would you like to plug anything or give a shout out to anybody? Well, nope. Burgerlaw.com. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks for your we'll time. We'll put up David. everything, everybody. Gary, thank you for your time. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. All right.